So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Andy Mitchell. I am the uh, second Andy. Uh, we also have Andy Bingham online, who's another co-host. I am from NASA's Earth Science Data and Information System Project out in sunny uh, Goddard uh, Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. So I want to take the time to welcome everyone to our third day uh, of our open source science for Earth System Observatory Mission Data Processing Study Workshop. This is our second uh, workshop. We held our first workshop last year in October timeframe. Uh, some of you may have attended that also. Um, so far, we've had a very successful two days of speakers. Uh, our first session kicked off with some science collaboration approaches. Uh, then we moved into some speakers talking on NASA's mission data processing system. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from some of our, our non-NASA partners on some of their science mission processing approaches. Uh, um, a reminder, I think you should have seen it when you logged on that this meeting is being recorded and the pr proceedings will be available on our website. Um, we are asking everyone to enter your full name into the Zoom link, your first name and your last name. This helps us recognize you if you have a question and we need to uh, address anything. Um, if you do experience any technical issues throughout the workshop, please contact staff at esipfed.org. And I believe I put that into the chat. Um, and even though uh, we're using the exact same link throughout the four days of the workshop, we ask that you not forward to your colleagues, but please have them register um, and then they'll get the link. We're trying to keep track of uh, who's attending and we can send up any follow-up information, including additional meetings. Um, so I do wanna thank all of our speakers that we have today. I do realize th the times are not convenient for everyone, um, especially since we have a lot of non-US partners on today. Um, since we do have a full agenda, members of our study team will be helping us to keep on schedule. So you may hear a warning of uh, two minutes or a one minute left um, before the end of your presentation. Um, this is meant to be an interactive discussion. Uh, so we do ask that you put your comments, put your questions, uh, reply to questions um, inside of the chat feature in Zoom. Uh, we do have prioritized space at the end of each session. On the agenda, it says fishbowl, um, where we'll be asking our presenters uh, questions, the study architecture working group. Um, it's dedicated time for them. Um, we do have a slight change to the schedule. Uh, the last two days at the end of our sessions, we had breakout sessions. Today, we will do something different. Today, we're going to have one larger a group discussion that's going to be led by our SOG, the System Architecture Working Group. Um, so it's going to give a chance for the entire audience to participate there. Uh, lastly, uh, a reminder, we do have a code of conduct for our workshop. So the main principle being all participants are treated with respect and consideration, valuing a diversity of views and opinions. Um, so before we kick things off, uh, Natasha or Elias, anything else you want to add before we move on to the next session? I don't have anything to add. Neither. Andy, anything? <laughs> Just a second logged in. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I can hear you and see you. Sounds great. It. Actually, sorry, Andy, one thing. Um, Sarah is going to put in the chat some information for a survey. So that's kind of just our way of making sure that we capture the variety of views and perspectives um, when we're considering what our architectures, the different variations of architectures should look like. So that link is there and we'll keep it open for at least a week. Um, so Sarah will put it in and we'll put it in sporadically throughout the day as well. Perfect. Over to you, Andy. All right. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so uh, we're going to continue the session we started yesterday. Um, this is a session we're listening to um, uh, Earth system, uh, Earth processing uh, architectures from non uh, NASA missions. So yesterday we heard from USGS, NOAA, and, um, and JAXA, 
And today we're going to be hearing from uh, a variety of other agencies. So to kick this off, um, I'd like to introduce um, Osamu, um, uh, sorry, apologies, uh, Azir Majib from um, uh, ISRO, the, in the Indian Space Research Organization. I believe it's uh, something like 10.30 in the evening um, with Azir. So um, uh, thank you for joining us on such a <laughs> late time. Um, Azir is a, a scientist um, uh, working in the National Remote Sensing Center. He has over 13 years of experience working in the domain of uh, workflow automation for Earth observation satellites and data processing and dissemination. So um, he'll be able to give us a great talk on um, the perspectives from ISRO. Um, so thank you, over to you Azir, and we'll, we'll give you your 15 minutes and um, we'll give you a two minute warning when we get to the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you for uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Uzair Mujib, working as scientist SF at Data Processing Software Group, National Remote Sensing Center, Indian Space Research Organization, located in Hyderabad, India. So I basically work on the automation of workflows for Indian remote sensing satellites, data processing and dissemination. So at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for providing me the opportunity to speak for uh, open source science for ESO mission data processing study workshop. And I also thank my senior scientist Ro for nominating me as a speaker. So uh, basically National Remote Sensing Center, which is an integral part of Indian Space Research Organization located in Hyderabad, has the mandate of establishment of ground stations for receiving remote sensing satellite data, generation of data products and dissemination it disseminating it to the users, as well as development of techniques for the remote sensing applications, including disaster management support, geospatial services for good governance and capacity building for professionals, faculty members and students. So in order to process and disseminate Earth observation data, NRSC has set up an integrated multi-mission ground segment for Earth observation satellites, which is also called as IMGOS. So uh, I'll be speaking about IMGOS in detail. So uh, IMGOS is basically a system of systems which has been set up as an integrated multi-mission ground segment for Earth observation satellites at Shabnagar campus. This facility is equipped with uh, a state-of-the-art data acquisition systems which receive data from various satellites in S, X, K, and KU bands. IMGOs, uh, uh, NRC has set up uh, ground stations at Shadnagar, Antarctica, and Jodhpur. Along with that, data is also acquired at Svalbard and various other international ground stations. So uh, IMGOs basically handles around 95 satellite passes and raw data volumes of around 1.5 TB on a daily basis. This all, uh, all this data uh, goes through the various levels of processing like level zero processing, level one, followed by level one and level two processing. So uh, uh, the, all the generated products uh, go through stringent quality checks and value added products are also generated on demand. So all these generated products uh, belong to either microwave or uh, optical region in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum with a resolution ranging from 0.28 meters to 360 meters. There's a wide variety of users of this data ranging from government agencies, industry, in ISRO's internal users, as well as academic users. So uh, NRC has set up uh, ground stations and huge computing and storage infrastructure for processing remote sensing data. So the key uh, driving requirement behind this is the organization's goal for uh, utilization, for enhancing the utilization of remote sensing by delivering quality data products as per payload specifications, as well as developing value added services, including generation of thematic products, which cater to a wide variety of applications in agriculture, forestry, soil science, disaster management, water resources, ocean and atmospheric studies and urban development domains. 
apart from this, uh, there's a central uh, outreach facility which has been established, uh, which uh, caters to the uh, capacity building programs by organizing uh, workshops, academic partnerships, and industry collaborations. The various uh, customers of uh, uh, the gen data generated at IMGOs are the government departments, academic institutions, and private organizations as well. The various, uh, the various centers of ISRO are the stakeholders at IMGOs, as one, uh, one of the ISRO centers uh, 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 makes the uh, satellite, uh, another center develops the payload, and another center develops the uh, uh, launch vehicles. So there are certain external dependencies also for processing of data, like uh, data is downloaded from ECMWF, which is the European Center for Medium Term Weather Forecast. Data is also uh, downloaded from uh, MODIS websites, uh, USGS and Copernicus. So uh, this is the uh, block diagram of the uh, IMGO's system architecture. So uh, the uh, IMGOs is driven by the uh, availability of uh, uh, the past schedule files and state vectors which are generated at the uh, ISRO TTC and commanding ground stations. This uh, data which is acquired in real time goes to various levels of processing like level zero processing followed by level one and level two processing. Uh, apart from ISRO's own ground stations, uh, ISRO has also established uh, various international ground stations at uh, Svalbard, uh, Fairbanks, and also uh, USGS has been established as a virtual ground station facility. So uh, the uh, ISRO's design and development team works on the algorithms to generate the standard and higher level products. And this team also develops the workflow automation software under a multi-mission environment so that the entire chain right from acquisition till the product dissemination is automated. So the gen generated data products go through automated and visual quality checks for assessing the radiometric and geometric fidelity of the data products. The, uh, the final, uh, the qualified data products are finally catalog cataloged and disseminated to users through various dissemination modes. Uh, uh, there is also a uh, subscription model of data dissemination, wherein systematic coverage of uh, user's area of interest is disseminated to him. So there is also uh, Bhunidhi, which is ISRO's data dissemination hub, uh, which is a web application. So uh, we'll talk more on this particular uh, application later in the later slides. And uh, finally, there's a, a enterprise monitor and alert generation software, which monitors the entire system's performance the processing latencies and creates accountability reports and generates automatic alerts in case any anomaly is noted. Uh, moving further, uh, this is the uh, component and infrastructure view of uh, IMGOs. So data acquired as uh, at uh, NRSC's ground stations and other international ground stations uh, is pooled it is uh, pulled in, in the IMGO central storage. So currently uh, we are receiving uh, data from around 23 remote sensing satellites, which includes uh, 15 Indian and eight foreign satellites. So data uh, from uh, Sentinel-1 and 2 is also pulled in to IMGOs uh, from the Copernicus hub, has, as the uh, NRSC has been identified as a regional hub for dissemination of data from Sentinel series of satellites. All this data is systematically archived on a centralized on-premise uh, storage area network, uh, which is a hierarchical storage. So, uh, and the algorithms developed and tested uh, in the development and analysis environment are used to process the, this data. The, uh, there are uh, workflow management systems, uh, which ensures that this data is processed within a stipulated amount of time over the compute infrastructure. And overall, a distributed processing approach is being followed, uh, which ensures the efficient utilization of uh, compute and storage resources. Uh, the uh, final, the uh, generated data products on, uh, are archived on the storage area network, and a copy of it is put to Bhunidhi for dissemination to users. Uh, Bhunidhi storage is like a, a rolling archives. Uh, it stores the latest uh, six months of 
data archive, uh, while the entire historic uh, archives are maintained at the IMGO central storage. So uh, moving a bit for, further, uh, uh, now I'll uh, delve a bit deep into the processing components and the corresponding implementation techniques and the various uh, open source technologies used. So the real-time uh, data ingest receives the payload and spacecraft data and, gen and generates consolidated payload data along with attitude and orbit profile. This software uses multi-processing, uh, multi-threading, socket programming and inter-process communication techniques to process the data in real time. The concepts of kernel hardening, hardening uh, service level blocking are used to securely exchange data across systems and networks. Here, uh, the software reuse is encouraged such that common core modules are made available as a library and can be extended for future missions. Uh, the software architecture also enables scalability in terms of data rates and mission supported. The compute environment involves multi-core CPUs with RAMs up to 512 GB running uh, RHEL Linux. GNU and Intel compilers are used to compile this code. Uh, coming to the open source technologies, we uh, use Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB, and open virtualization format. Coming to data product generation, uh, here we do uh, level one and level two processing uh, uh, to generate radiometrically and geometrically corrected data products along with the host of uh, information and geophysical products such as uh, NDVI, water layer, snow cover, albedo, and uh, on-demand merging and mosaicing is also taken up on user's requirement. So the implementation techniques involve multi-processing, multi-threading, and in-memory processing. So the software, this software also works in a multi-mission environment supporting common use of infrastructure. The compute environment involves uh, multi-core CPUs with the RAM up to 5, 12 GB, uh, CPU cores of up to 32, and GPGPU-based systems, and also the compute work virtualization technologies. Uh, the uh, entire moving uh, further, the entire workflow at IMGOS is automated through the custom developed workflow manager, uh, which is a which are multi mission. So customized uh, software load balancing and automatic automatic prioritization algorithm form an integral part of the workflow manager in order to ensure optimal utilization of compute resources. Uh, there is a centralized uh, web based monitoring system which keeps track of what is happening in the uh, ground station and generates automatic as well as interactive reports in terms of performance and latencies. Uh, critical resources such as compute, st storage and networks are continuously being monitored for any anomalies. Uh, these, uh, the workflow and monitoring software are realized through event-driven software architecture using messaging-based asynchronous communication models and non-blocking IOs. The events generated by the processing entities, such as the uh, real-time processing and the data processing, pass through the uh, event processors, which interpret the context and meaning of the events, depend depending upon which the uh, downstream activities are triggered. So this category of software extensively uses open source tools, such as Apache Mina, RabbitMQ for messaging and queuing, and Apache iText for reporting. Another important category of software is the uh, software to check the uh, quality of data products and to uh, provide feedback for system improvement. So uh, this software does uh, automatic quality checks for pixels, line losses, radiometric and geometric in inconsistencies, followed by interactive image, image assessment. Uh, the software is built using the client server architecture where, uh, wherein the Automatic checks happen at the uh, server and interactive image assessment happens at the clients. Uh, shell scripting, inter-process communication, socket programming are some of the implementation techniques here. Uh, so here we extensively use uh, uh, the open source technologies such as GDAL, uh, OpenJDK, Postgres, OpenCV, Redis, QGIS, and Docker technologies. 
uh, NRC has also established and operationalized a, a unique calibration and validation facility uh, to enable the calibration needs of optical and microwave sensors. Uh, we have also built a technical competence to col uh, collaborate for the calibration of foreign remote sensing sensors. Uh, finally, uh, coming to the data dissemination part, uh, NRC has developed a, a Bhunidhi web application uh, which facilitates the dissemination of free as well as the price data. products to online users. Uh, satellite data from around first data is over 30 years. Uh, user friendly search options, uh, search to <coughs> uh, target area identification. Uh, there are various uh, download options available, such as uh, HTTPS based downloads, API based downloads, and uh, obviously the FTP and uh, media based downloads. Thank you. You are not able to hear me. So one minute. You can't hear me. <laughs> one minute. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. You are audible. Sorry, I'm having audible? one. One more minute. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Should I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay. So uh, there are various uh, download options available, such as HTTPS based downloads, API, and FTP based downloads. Uh, this application also enables near real time full resolution of uh, data over the web. Uh, uh, this software uh, optimizes the resource utilization <clears throat> by implementing rate limiting and algorithms in order to serve maximum products to the maximum number of users. Uh, there is also a, a built-in feedback mechanism on the usage of data and general feedback on performance, navigation, user experience, as well as the quality of data products uh, so as to uh, continue, continuously improve the system. Uh, moreover, a new feature called the on-demand processing is under development, which would uh, enable users to uh, uh, use NRSC's compute uh, infrastructure to process their own data. This framework uh, accompanied by an image processing toolkit would enable users to define customized workflows and execute tasks on Bhunidhi platform and download only the results. The platform would support all the users who have different uh, skill sets from novice to the advanced users. Uh, for novice users, it will provide uh, pre-built models which can be readily executed over the data sets and for advanced users, it will provide a platform to develop, test, and execute their own algorithms. So this platform will uh, enable collaborative and open development of data products and services and, and would promote the idea that the processing should move closer to the data rather than data flowing towards the processing end. So the software implementation of Bhunidhi uh, involves open source components like Kubernetes, Docker containers, uh, Leaflet APIs, GeoServer, Apache Subversion, Apache Airflow for uh, workflows, etc. Azir, we're coming towards the end here. Um, we're running out of time. If you could sort of wrap up soon. I will just okay. wrap up. So the, uh, the ISRO software development process uh, is governed by the uh, ISRO software process document, which is actually the implementation of IEEE 12207 standards. So it caters to a wide variety of software, including uh, image data processing and information services, as well as mobile applications. <coughs> uh, this is the uh, summary of what uh, I have already discussed. So we do have legacy data, which is seamlessly integrated within the workflows by developing work wrappers around them. We extensively use open source technologies for uh, data and image processing, web applications, and data-driven applications. So, uh, and we do develop uh, uh, software in an open and collaborative environment across the various ISCO centers. And uh, 
uh, in order to handle cyber security, uh, the, the virtual routing and forwarding has been recently used as one of the technologies uh, so that uh, people, uh, developers working across the different uh, uh, geographical locations can connect to the development systems. So uh, we ensure uh, system efficiency uh, through the multi-mission based processing capabilities, which ensures common use of infrastructure and reuse of processing software. So uh, for, uh, in order to support uh, the open source science, NRSC uh, has already adopted the uh, open data concept uh, for open data access and visualization of data through the Bhunidi portal. And uh, Team Bhunidi is also setting up an accessible on-demand processing platform to enable users to test their uh, uh, user-defined processing workflows. Uh, obviously, there are certain uh, barriers like uh, cybersecurity policies, requirements on, for authentication and authorization, which are being handled and we are uh, continuously trying to uh, uh, come over these uh, barriers. So uh, and, uh, what, what is now required is an open source toolbox for image processing and analysis for ISRO's uh, IRS missions, which will be a reality shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you, sir, for the great talk. Appreciate that, thank you. Um, so let's um, move, uh, so we'll, we'll, be, we'll be doing uh, question and answers um, in about 45 minutes. If you're able to stick around, that would be great. Understand it's late the night for you. Okay, so yeah. now we're going okay. to in the morning, we'll move over to Italy. Um, so we have Francesco Tatarini, uh, Rani, sorry, um, of the Italian Space Agency. He's a member of the engineering unit working on ground segments and midstream development. Thanks for joining us, Francesco. Faro, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So in this presentation, uh, first of all, uh, thank you to uh, the organizer to invite me uh, to present this uh, work of uh, ASI. And in this presentation, I show you the Scientific Operation Center uh, which is a work we are uh, carrying on in a collaboration for a preface A with uh, uh, ASI and JPL. And uh, I also present you the uh, ASI mission access data system that is uh, that will be used in the future in order to access all the uh, mission of uh, uh, ASI. Uh, the main goals, what, what are the main goals? Uh, uh, the uh, Scientific Operation Center is uh, devoted to uh, acquire the data by and process uh, uh, raw data by Buni Sensor installed on board Free Flyer, which is a, a platform developed by uh, ASI that will host uh, maybe in the future uh, um, instrument also from different agency. And uh, uh, the SOC is devoted to process this data, uh, pass uh, uh, processed level one data to the JPN NASA. Uh, acquired data from GPN NAS, I made uh, this data available to the user and to the uh, MADS. MADS uh, is uh, the uh, multi-mission data access system that is devoted to uh, distribute and made available all the data from all ASI mission to the user. Um, the main objective and goal of ASI is to uh, make uh, this data accessible to machine-to-machine uh, -machine interface, but also uh, to apply the paradigm user to the data in order to allow the user to make their own process directly in the place where the data are. Uh, the MADS is uh, offer also some multi-mission value-added services to the ground segment and uh, data bulk, uh, bulk data processing uh, services. Uh, about the contest, uh, uh, we have uh, the SOC that is uh, a basic ground segment devoted to the processing of uh, uh, raw data coming from uh, sensor, while the MADS is the uh, place uh, where this data can be uh, distributed uh, to the user communities. Uh, regarding the implementation roadmaps, uh, uh, the purple circle is where we are with the uh, Scientific Operations Center, and it is uh, under development uh, ground segment, but it's coming from uh, um, a history of the ground segment that are uh, time by time updated and improved 
Uh, and in our vision uh, uh, is to um, work uh, uh, to uh, uh, generalize at the new generation ground segment where um, co co constituted of different uh, blo blocks that can be combined in order to uh, realize the, the final ground segment. Um, regarding the architecture of the scientific operation center, uh, in the left, uh, we have some technology of open source technology uh, that we are uh, can, uh, plan to use, uh, while uh, on the left, uh, uh, some of interface uh, uh, that we plan to use in order to distribute data uh, to the user. Of course, as I told before, this uh, um, ground segment um, have uh, also a, per a precursor already in operation, for example, for Prisma mission. Uh, about uh, the uh, basic concept uh, of the process that we are currently using uh, is uh, mainly based uh, on the thin layer, which is a, a specific um, uh, processing behavior in which uh, each uh, uh, processing facility, it is able to check uh, on the product catalog, uh, which uh, input data uh, needs to process and produce output products. Uh, in this way, uh, it is very easy to extend uh, the ground segment with the new processor to have uh, multiple versions uh, of uh, the same uh, processing uh, of uh, the same product, uh, because each process, uh, each, each processing facility in, uh, in certain way it is able to check if uh, its input is available on the catalog and start to process uh, and made available uh, its uh, output product uh, and metadata and insert them into um, catalog. In this way, a processing chain implementation, it's very easy to, uh, to be implemented. Uh, of course, uh, this ground segment is also a centralized and monitoring reporting system in order to monitoring uh, the status of all ongoing processing and uh, uh, the overall health status of the systems. Uh, regarding uh, the MADS, uh, uh, its implementation is at the starting block uh, and uh, the procedure uh, for uh, uh, the invitation to tender process uh, it's, uh, um, will be started soon. Uh, the multi-mission data access uh, um, system uh, is based on cloud, uh, primarily on on-premises uh, cloud, but it will also use uh, external clouds uh, in order to um, arrange uh, for uh, uh, processing peaks uh, or for very resource consuming uh, uh, application, user application. Basically, uh, this uh, multi-mission data access system is composed by a very big data lake and a multi-mission catalog that can be updated and uh, easily adapted in order to host um, different mission in the same place. Uh, as also a multi-mission long-term data preservation archive and uh, uh, provide uh, a rapid application development for the user, maybe based on uh, Jupyter Notebook or technology uh, that are also allowed to um, user to start uh, uh, processing contained in Docker containers, uh, but also offer the possibility to have a uh, desk and front end uh, to uh, guide the user in, in using services provided by these systems uh, and uh, multi-mission uh, user management systems. On the left of these slides, uh, we can see some of the standard interface we plan to have uh, um, as a access, uh, as, as a uh, distribution interface uh, for the products contained in this uh, uh, architecture. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, data lake, um, this data lake uh, will, will have the uh, basic characteristic to, has, to be uh, multi-mission, multi-sensor, multi-levels, and to host uh, uh, products coming from different mission with the different characteristics. And uh, uh, this data lake is basically based on a, um, configurable and flexible data retention policies. Uh, in this way, it will be possible to configure uh, how the data will be kept in the different um, area of the world according to the level or uh, according to the sensor type. Uh, 
uh, in order to uh, keep in the catalog strictly the data that are really uh, in, in which the, the user are really interested in. Um, finally, uh, of course, uh, uh, th there will be also the possibility to keep uh, uh, some data of interest, for example, for scientific purposes uh, um, uh, with a specific uh, data policy, for example, to keep uh, permanently all the data on a Tonga volcano to allow the user to perform the research on this uh, specific uh, um, data set. Uh, the uh, access uh, to this catalog will be guaranteed uh, both to uh, HMI interface in order to allow the user to perform their researches uh, uh, without uh, in very easy way and check uh, if uh, uh, the data of interest are available among uh, all the mission handled in this uh, uh, catalog. So in this way, it will be possible uh, to check uh, on the same area of interest uh, and time window of interest, which data are available uh, among all the missions supported by the system. Also, for uh, uh, it will be possible to perform p feasibility analysis uh, and the new acquisition plan for those missions that uh, allows this kind of uh, um, user request uh, uh, planning uh, uh, capability. Uh, the same uh, functional, uh, functionality will be available also to machine-to-machine -machine interface, uh, and uh, uh, this will enable uh, the user to put in their uh, application uh, the possibility to check uh, catalog, download data, and access data, even at uh, a programming level. Uh, regarding uh, um, the rapid application development, of course, the user will be able to access the catalog to machine ma to machine interface, run the uh, application written in Python, uh, and check the data directly using programmatic interface, uh, or also um, run application to uh, a Docker container. Uh, also, it will be possible for the user um, to run their application based on time schedule or also on data-driven mechanism, for example, for those applications which requires uh, to be started uh, once some data are uh, available, for example, on a specific area of interest. Of course, this uh, uh, um, environment will be able to uh, the user to publish the results to different format, for example, uh, uh, OGC formats. Uh, another uh, functionality that is foreseen is the possibility um, for multi-mission application uh, to be uh, published and made available to the user with their own resources. This means that if uh, some uh, multi-mission function or application, maybe co-registration, uh, feature extraction, are uh, particularly promising uh, and uh, performing, uh, this could be uh, made in a specific place of the multi of these uh, systems uh, and made available uh, to all users using uh, own resources and, uh, and in an engineering format. Um, uh, other functionality that will be provided by this system, of course, is uh, uh, we think it's very useful for the user. It's the possibility to have an help desk and front end uh, for registration and accreditation procedure, but also uh, for authentication, uh, help to using RAD environment and uh, value added uh, uh, services. Uh, and uh, the possibility for uh, every user community to submit. Uh, bugs, uh, report anomalies, uh, problems on data quality, or issue specific requests, for example, to uh, require some, uh, to keep some data in a specific area of interest or for uh, the predefined time windows or processing parameters. Uh, we think that this uh, um, service is very helpful in order to um, improve the uh, diffusion of this uh, system among user community. Uh, also, uh, MATS will offer the possibility for of bulk data reprocessing, uh, in this case, as well as uh, um, to handle uh, some uh, user request peaks. Uh, an external cloud uh, um, provider could be used in order to instantiate 
uh, this processing chain uh, outside uh, uh, the, uh, the on-premises cloud and in this way handle um, in, a, in a more flexible way the processing peaks. Uh, regarding uh, uh, the user management, uh, um, we, are uh, we are implementing uh, uh, the possibility for, uh, um, for, for, for the user to register in a single place and check which missions they need to access to. Uh, of course, for some of these missions, the um, access could be uh, open and free. For some other, uh, the possibility to sign uh, uh, some uh, license uh, could be uh, envisaged. And this, in, in this case, the, the system will propose uh, uh, the possibility to sign uh, licensing according to the mission the user is interested in. Also, um, Two the system. Two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Also, the system uh, foreseen the possibility to use uh, some. Uh, um, uh, federation accessing interface uh, provided by European and national um, legislation. Uh, about the implementation plan, uh, we uh, use some legacy software, of course, and this is encouraged uh, when possible, mostly for processing or catalog, uh, cataloging purposes. Uh, the use of open source software is widespread, both in the design and in ground segment of the ground segment and for the multi-mission data access uh, platform. Also the use of international standard and best practice of, and is a best practice is generally strong, strongly encouraged and is mandatory in the implementation of interfaces uh, and the data access fun functionalities. Uh, cybersecurity, of course, uh, is today very important and is strongly addressed uh, starting from the design and development operation. Uh, a dedicated cybersecurity assessment it is required in order to uh, define the customized plan with respect to existing external interface, user category, and uh, sensitivity of data, and so on. Uh, regarding uh, the uh, advantages of this uh, system, of course, the sharing of computing resources between multiple mission help to increase the efficiency of the system. And uh, uh, this is one of the driver of this uh, implementation, uh, as well as the possibility of having uh, common services already available to the ground segment, uh, also as a positive effect on the cost of implementing new mission, for example, long-term long data preservation, uh, reprocessing, uh, uh, user, um, uh, multi-mission user handling system and so on. Also the possibility to have a flexible retention policies with higher level of configurability allows the store and archive uh, to be customized to the data uh, which the user have a real interest in. Uh, regarding uh, um, uh, the MALS allow, of course, uh, uh, supporting open source science user community to access uh, to a single system, to a large portfolio of AO and non-AO data, and to share their results and application and uh, algorithms. Uh, of course, this facilitates the exchange of information with other user and research researches and allow the expansion of knowledge in the space field and uh, diffusion of techniques, methodology, and algorithms within the community. Uh, the possibility of making uh, the most providing multi-mission functionality available to all the community with the dedicated resources uh, uh, can meet uh, institutional and commercial interest for which it is uh, important to define finished product and services from spatial data with certain uh, slime performance, uh, and uh, in tune, this can push uh, research activity in the, areas, uh, in the main area of index uh, of uh, basic research. Um, of, um, some of the limits is that some of the um, mission handled by the system uh, uh, can be open and free, but not, uh, but not anonymously. So uh, generally, the user registration 
is a requirement uh, and in some in some cases it is necessary also to uh, to accept uh, user uh, agreement uh, regarding the future uh, many states of international organization are implementing uh, uh, such a system like this with uh, uh, distribute the data to a wide uh, community. So uh, the possibility to implement a federation mechanism in order to allow uh, the various catalog to look each other and uh, the possibility uh, for use uh, that uh, access in Italy to uh, our catalog uh, to look for Indian products or American products in their own catalog could be very interested in the share knowledge, uh, cooperation, uh, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, improve uh, research activities uh, worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, Francesco, and some great points made at the end there, so I do appreciate it. Um, so let's move um, rapidly on now to uh, let's fly over to Germany, over to, uh, actually, I think, Conrad, uh, maybe in Washington at the moment, uh, to Conrad Albrecht um, from the... Uh, German Aerospace Center, uh, DLR. Uh, Conrad is a PI of a, um, a large proposal, a large work called the Large Scale Data Mining in Earth Observation. Thank you, Conrad, for providing the DR DLR perspective. Over to you. And we'll give you a warning at uh, 12 minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot. I um, really appreciate that um, I can share a couple of thoughts here because uh, I feel home to the US and uh, EU, so it's a, it's a good collaborative thing and maybe we can get something moving here um, on this front. Um, and let me give you some background. So yes, as correctly introduced, uh, I'm working with a lot of other colleagues, um, among them Max Schwinger, Jonas Eberle from the German Aerospace Center, also with IBM Research, um, for example, Henry Kahrmann and uh, Johannes Schmude and the LRC, which is the Leibniz Supercomputing Center, there is Nikolai Hammer and their team. So there are a lot of people behind, not just me, uh, who try to set up a system to scalably access all of these Earth observation data, and in particular, in my case, to apply them then to AI workflows. And this is a couple of insights I want to share to you uh, today in order to uh, yeah, move that field forward. So uh, specifically to give you some background, so I'm working right now with the Helmholtz AI, which is a German uh, public institute that is, uh, so specifically we are concerned about the following. Typically you have very little labels available in these Earth observation data, but also get quickly outdated. Now it's just impractical that, to that a lot of humans sit down and label all of this geospatial information, be it from satellite, be it from weather information, so no way. So, and there is this term of self-supervised learning, which takes just this huge amount of data and compresses them down to so-called feature vectors that can then be used for downstream tasks. And also you could think about procedures that uh, automatically generate your labels just by simple rules, uh, by thresholding rules, taking LIDAR data, laser measurement saying, okay, if the statistics of these data is in a certain in a certain range, we assume it's most likely vegetation, or if it's just uh, completely absorbed the laser light, for example, it's maybe a water body. And But these labels will be noisy. And then uh, the goal is to just use uh, machine learning AI models in order to um, train them on these noisy labels. So that's just the background scientifically, what we're achieving to do. And then our vehicle for that is the DLR terabyte um, platform and I introduce a little bit um, what we are aiming at here. So first of all, we want to have efficient data assemble, an, a, like an engine that can efficiently assemble uh, data for machine learning and also cross layer query them. Then also we want to co-locate the data and the compute. So the GPUs that do the number scrunching and heavy lifting for AI need to be close to the geos data. And then also we want to discover data in a sense that, oh, if there are so many, can I plow efficiently through them to get the right uh, training data set for my models? And of course, in the very end, uh, it won't happen that all the data will be stored in one place. So federated learning, so the approach and art of having multiple of those platforms and letting them work together is also an, a goal we aim at. 
And of course, as I introduced already, so the uh, Earth Observation Center at the German Aerospace Center is mainly interested in that. And we collaborate with the Leibniz Supercomputing Center, which is in the top 500 um, computing centers around the world. And also the Helmers Association I mentioned, uh, Technical University of Munich is involved from the academic side. And of course we partner with uh, corporate research such for example, like IBM research and others. So, and um, here I'm focusing uh, mainly on a solution that can integrate this publicly and maybe also privately available data from industry. And of course you have to implement uh, GDPR and so on, but that's not the focus of our discussion here. So the very high level um, setup of the system is very, very traditional in the sense that you have your hardware infrastructure that makes available the services, HPC service, cloud services and so on. Then on top, you put the data and uh, on that you put the compute uh, and uh, in particularly with respect to GIS uh, or so Geospatial Information System APIs and uh, also some containerized environment. And you also want to, at the very, very top level, have an interface to the user. And across these different uh, levels, you need to, to efficiently manage these data with some tools. So um, this slide picks kind of open source solution that we uh, employ for this. Uh, going back to the to a lower level where you want to also have a, an overview and monitoring. We use, for example, Prometheus installed on all of these machines, and then they can report their metrics about loads uh, and uh, utilization of the resources to Grafana uh, can be visualized and operators can just manage the system. Then in order to abstract away a little bit the um, yeah, the resources in terms of hardware, uh, we work with Kubernetes and Docker to just encapsulate all the software we want to use. And based on that in uh, Kubernetes, you can then uh, put on top the, uh, a framework that we experiment with right now, it's called Argo, Argo works flows. And that simply takes a couple of Docker containers that generate a proce processing chain. So uh, one of our teams, for example, exploits this to when the mission data is readily available on the platform, then they have their processing um, engines in order to derive level one or le level two products. And then this is integrated by such, such workflows on top of Kubernetes. One maybe nice thing um, or a good thing that we also explore is the so-called En-ROAD route pr project. It's based, uh, it's an NVIDIA project and they essentially uh, generate these lightweight uh, containers that have a focus on um, cleanly separating uh, this, uh, the, the storage. Because at some point you have certain private data uh, you don't want to share with others. You want to make sure that um, these, these systems are well separated. So from a security point of view, Enroot is maybe a name you should keep in mind for your projects. And uh, Open On Demand is another actually uh, project that is funded by the National Science Foundation and also used in the US, US a lot in order to efficiently use the resources you have available, for example, spinning up Jupyter Notebook or having a QGIS spun up. And it makes it very easy for the end user to interface. So ex essentially the end user just needs a web browser, that's it, and then it can um, trigger, I need that many Jupyter Notebooks or I need that many QGIS MATLAB instances, and then off you go and you can use it. So that's maybe another important thing. Regarding the... Um, data processing data cubes I want to talk about in a minute. DAS is a nice parallel processing framework in order to um, just serve these X arrays, these data cubes that are actually you can think of as space time rasterized pixel pixelated um, versions of data uh, of geospatial data. Yeah, and of course for deep learning, I mentioned here PyTorch and TensorFlow that needs to be integrated. And I heard it already earlier. So the Europeans have quite a push in uh, developing a thing that's uh, called the European Data Cube. Uh, that is an important thing we try out. And there's also I heard about it earlier here in this presentation, the Stack, the Spatial Temporal ca uh, Asset Catalog. Essentially, you just have a lightweight meta database or meta way of uh, indexing all your files uh, where the geospatial information um, like satellite information or weather information is stored in. And then you can um, in a condensed framework or a unified framework access them. All right, okay, this is some details in the uh, interest of time. Let me skip that and go to a second um, element I wanna highlight here is 
um, an extension of that terabyte initiative, mainly um, inspired by work I did earlier. Um, if you think about it in terms of data storage, it is similar um, to, I would say, the hierarchy you build up on an ordinary laptop. You have your disk space, then you have your memory, and on top go a couple of layers of caches that get closer and closer to the compute. And how we envision it is like this. Uh, at, the, um, GM, at the German Aerospace Center, there is, of course, a huge uh, national archive of tape storage. Um, One minute. But it's very, yes, One thank minute. you. OK. And um, yeah, what you essentially do is um, you can load that into the warm storage, and um, which is maybe hundreds of petabytes, which uh, you say is, uh, for example, um, ordinary disk spinning. And then on top comes this hot data cube, which is these index data. By the way, just a question. I have a clock running here. I have 15 minutes, right, isn't it? Yeah, you still have um, seven Five minutes, minutes, right? Left. OK, thank you. Yeah. Good. yeah. All right, sorry. And um, the reason for that is the following. In deep learning, typically what you do is um, you have benchmark data sets. But what happens today is people put them out on a server, and you can download as a zip file or something like this, or in an uh, Amazon storage, and you can just download. But what happens if these data gets updated hour by hour? So weather data, for example, uh, ACMWF and so on, the European um, weather forecasting models. Uh, then it's not that easy to just store a couple of files and uh, update them. And this hot data storage, would, a data cube would exactly do that as in a computer with caches close to the CPU. Just index the most relevant data you need for deep learning, for example, and make them available as a data cube. And the, the um, data we use here in the PEARS uh, platform um, that is developed by IBM, for example, is um, HBase. It's a key value store. And you have to also manage a little bit the metadata. Therefore, there's post-GIS. And uh, of course, everything gets dockerized. And the compute uh, is essentially executed by open source software like GDAL and PDAL. PDAL is the equivalent of GDAL just for point cloud data, three dimensional, because you can also have LIDAR data, for example. And Spark SQL just generates like big tables, ordinary like spreadsheets, but distributed, and then you can query it. And on top, of course, goes REST APIs and so on. And um, let me summarize this, what happens in here. Here is this data cube you can see to the right, which in, in black, the two black um, uh, images. The one is just the data, latitude and longitude. You index, you group your pixels, or maybe also your vector information, like point cloud data. And then they get stored linearly and distributed in that key value. And the access for key value stores is extremely fast and efficient. And that makes these hot data cubes so um, prominent and so promising for this deep learning and AI workflows. All right, and uh, this is actually brings me to kind of like an, uh, an initiative which I would like to push a little bit um, with OGC and others and all the community that is listening here. For these data cubes, there exists a couple of APIs. Um, most prominently, maybe this um, DARPA, the Data Access and Processing APIs from OGC. But uh, there is still, it's, it's just this work in progress and bits and pieces is missing. And also the Sentinel Hub uh, goes beyond that ordinary um, processing frameworks, adds another couple of bits of pieces. All I'm saying is there's a lot out there, but it needs to be consolidated. It would be nice if we can all sit together also with um, industry and just uh, develop a RESTful web API that is independent of the platform and can uh, query those data cubes I talked about uh, early on. And um, that would be actually a nice point for a discussion later on. And I'm very interested in getting in touch with people who think the same way. All right. And um, regarding compute and infrastructure, so um, as mentioned, uh, our system is close to the um, Leibniz Supercomputing Center in Munich. Uh, and that has the SuperMOOC NG um, supercomputing cluster, so we can efficiently crunch the numbers there. And um, the cluster is essentially put into two pieces. You have a GPSF attached uh, big storage of 40 of petabytes of HDD, so of hard disk, and uh, one petabyte of solid state disk. So far, it's getting extended. And also um, cloud-based REST API um, um, bucket where you can we can experiment with this hybrid approaches between traditional HPC, 
and uh, on the other hand with these new cloud paradigms. Core data sets we want to host is the Sentinel and Landsat product data set, but um, again, as mentioned, in the very end, it's about federated learning. So joining with other initiatives like the one that is uh, right now pursued by NASA in order to have an independent REST API to let uh, these compute workflows work across data centers. So that is the yeah, federated um, approach. And uh, the hot data cube is one key ingredient, I believe, that is important for that. And this is why I mentioned it. All right, so in summary, the implementation strategy and focus of our system, the terabyte is uh, have this big geospatial data processing and particularly also for AI in a hybrid HPC and cloud environment. Uh, as far and as, most, as, as much as possible, we want to base it on open source, um, but there might be separate pieces that also uh, stay maybe commercial and that is also a good opportunity for, um, um, for the industry to Kind of chime in and then you have a nice way of transferring the knowledge from academia to industry and that also sparks businesses which i think is believe is a, is a good thing and a vehicle for that would be that web api interface i talked about which we could push through the ogc and cost efficiency is implemented um, in our case very simply by uh, dlr decided to just consolidate their computing resources in that um, um, supercomputing center yeah all right. Um, yeah, and the collaborative culture is I just want to mention we have this uh, AI for EO lab um, in Germany where all this AI research are kind of um, kind of coming together and uh, exchanging research ideas. And then we want to just combine that with the terabyte initiative and implement the models and see how we can push geospatial analytics and open sharing. Uh, yeah, we are involved in national and international proposals where these fair principles is pretty important. Yeah, this is how we implement the open sharing. Technology-wise, two challenges I just want to outline before I close is one is open source software is very nice uh, and collaboratively developed and so on. With, with, uh, but there, this also means that these cycles of uh, having new features is pretty rapid. And this is something you sometimes have to keep up with. So that's a little bit of a challenge. So sometimes software gets easily outdated, PM, the community mute, moves to a different paradigm, and that's a challenge to just keep track of it. And the other thing, you have to counterbalance this with security, right? If it's openly developed, of course, everyone can see the code and find bugs. But because the life cycle is so rapidly evolving, you also in practice, I feel it's a challenge. And we had it in the past a couple of times that uh, you you saw flaws popping up in open source software because just not not enough manpower to just really test very specifically these security needs. That's one challenge I would say. And with this, thank you for uh, the time. I'm already over, overdue, and here's a couple of collaborators which I also want to thank. Thank you. Thank you, Conrad. That was an excellent presentation. Um, I see a lot of synergies with a lot of the work that we're doing here and some of the other, uh, the NASA, NASA Data Processing Center. So I'm sure a lot of us will be following up with you on a lot of those recommendations and ways to work better together. Um, sure, so, thanks, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, good seeing you. Our next presentation, um, we have Klaus uh, Schiphol and Anka uh, Anjali. Uh, Klaus is the Biomass Mission Manager at ESA, and he will be presenting on the joint uh, NASA-ESA multi-mission algorithm and analysis platform, otherwise known as MAP, um, and the BioPow Biomass Product Algorithm Laboratory. And Anko will be presenting on the Open Science Platform. Um, she's an engineer at ESA on the Open Science Platform, and she'll be presenting some of the technologies that enable open science at ESA including the EO platforms, virtual labs, and the EO dashboard. Uh, good to have you with us, Klaus. Uh, we can see you and hear you. Good. Thank you for introducing us. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to present in this, in this workshop uh, some activities we have started in ESA on um, addressing this open science uh, topic. So as you already introduced, um, we have split the, the presentation, so I will talk a bit about uh, some activities we have started for the Biomass mission, so some very concrete mission-specific objectives, and then uh, Anke will take over and present some more general activities that we have started that uh, cross several missions and, and several applications. Um, so to the Biomass mission, um, 
Biomass is an Earth Explorer mission, so it's a science, it's an explorer mission that uh, is quite new. What uh, It's a P-band SAR, which has never been flown before in space. Uh, its main objective is to measure forest biomass. Um, and to support this mission, uh, we wanted to, to uh, foster a bit the open science uh, principles. And for this, we have uh, sort of uh, changing a bit the PDGS system that we used uh, in the past, uh, so which is a very conservative approach and, and open this a bit up. And we have uh, developed the mission algorithm and analysis platform. And it's currently a bit under discussion which PDGS elements will go to this platform. But um, as a minimum, it should enable the researchers to easily discover, process, and visualize and analyze all the data we collect with this mission. It will have tools uh, to uh, to compare data sets, so it will not only host biomass mission data, but also other mission data, and I will come to that a bit later, and also ground observations, and all this data will be free and open following the ESA, um, ESA data policy. It will provide the um, aversion-controlled um, repository of uh, the scientific algorithms, so the, all the level two algorithms that are developed for biomass and funded by ESA will be uh, made available through an open source uh, project through an open source repository. And finally, it should allow users to share their results to collaborate with each other. So this map exists already. So we have a prototype that is implemented at the moment. So there's some, some basic data, campaign data there. There's also some satellite data there. It's currently only open for um, the science teams, but it, uh, it, it, it will be opened in the next, next months to, the, to a larger community. And once the mission is launched in 2023, the, the map should be completely open to everyone. One important element of this map is that we operate or we, we develop this, this platform jointly uh, with NASA. So the reason for that is that NASA uh, issues a mission called NISA approximately at the same time. So it's also launched in 2023 and uh, we share some objectives with this mission. So both missions observe forest biomass. Both missions work as a, as a SAR mission, a synthetic aperture radar mission. So we share a lot of objectives and we share community. And we thought from the very beginning um, that we should uh, make a platform available where people can actually access both data sets um, and work with both data sets. And the, the whole thing is developed um, in close collaboration. Physically, these are separated platforms, but they are fully interoperable. So for a user, Basically, it does not make any difference if he sits on the ESA side or on the NASA side of the platform. He can still um, access both data sets jointly uh, without any issues. There's also, beside the NISA and the Biomass mission, there's also JEDI mission data. JEDI is a, is a LIDAR mission that has been launched uh, some time ago uh, that is hosted on this platform uh, to give access to really the complete um, lake of data that, that we collect for addressing forest biomass uh, research and retrieval. The center element, and, and this is, I think, uh, quite new. So these platforms, they, they have been used in the past. Uh, the, the, uh, and, and Anka will, will elaborate a bit more on that. So there we have already quite an advanced understanding how this works. Something that is quite new for us, at least at ESA, is that we want to make all the official um, processors available as an open source project. So everyone will get access to, to work on the actual processor, on the operational processor. And the reason for this is that we this, uh, that we realized that the development cycle for all these um, uh, explorer type of missions is extremely fast. So science science evolves very quickly, but the actual implementation of the of the findings from scientists go very slow. So usually you get the prototype that is developed by the scientist and it goes to industry who develops the operational processes in between. You have a lot of testing and uh, you easily end up uh, with a two year period where you can uh, implement updated uh, processor versions and updated algorithms. And we wanted to break the sequential um, update cycle a bit and, and do this more um, in a collaborative way, uh, working on, on one operational where every everyone, so the, the engineers, the software engineers and the scientists work on one operational processor um, and, and get a more, um, more collaborative uh, implementation cycle. And this is displayed here a bit on the right. So we have the first algorithm that are currently implemented and they already exist. I will show that a bit later. Um, then the, the whole uh, algorithm can be um, ingested in the map where you find all the data, so test data, validation data, and Every scientist basically can uh, modify the operational process and can test it against the standardized test procedure. 
Um, then it can be ingested in the, in the operational processes. So there's some acceptance review, of course, uh, but uh, as everyone works on the same process environment, um, this um, transition from the scientific development to the, to the operational uh, can go instantly and, and can go much faster. Um, this algorithm laboratory, we have already started. So all the, the algorithms um, that are currently developed, the processors are developed on an open source project uh, that is called Biopile. And you can find basically the code and everything um, in this GitHub repository, which is an open repository. And everyone is actually invited uh, to contribute to the development of these operational processors. Lessons learned uh, from these um, activities. Um, Initial, initially, there was a, actually a big skepticism by industry and um, by, also by the scientists, uh, but that actually quickly changed. Uh, I think they, both industry and scientists they value the centralized software review process and the transparency of the software development. Um, they, they also uh, value the benefits that is uh, established by common guidelines. So for industry, it's much easier to integrate uh, software that is uh, coded by scientists because they have to follow some, some standards, some best practices. So it's much easier to, to ingest those developments. Uh, there's a benefit of a common coding environment. So uh, all the software engineers immediately see which elements are changed by, by the scientists and how this can ingest um, in, in the operational processor. There's a great value of external contributions and we have started this only half a year ago and we already get some first contribution from external scientists. So we, we try to break up here also a bit this uh, centralized PI, centralized development cycle. And these are people who have actually no experience partly in, in earth observation. So we got one, one contributor that works in, in, in crypto mining and it just got curious about this and, and contributed a bit on, on the code development. So it's really breaking up and, and reaching out to new community. And finally, I think one of the, the lessons we have learned, and it was quite important during the first year of this uh, project, was that open source is not only about the license, and it is often believed, at least here in ESA, that you put an open license and then everything goes by itself. You have to put a lot of um, effort also in building up the communities and supporting the communities with tools, but also um, integrating them through workshops and, and those sort of things uh, to really build up a, a solid community around your, your software development. And with this, I hand over to Anka to present a bit more on the general perspectives of open source at ESA. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Yeah, so um, you've seen how, how the map facilitates working with the uh, science mission data, generating level two products and so forth. So now we move uh, in the following slides more towards uh, how we enable scientific exploitation if this data or other higher level products to resolve tasks such as um, information mining, information retrieval from Earth observation data or Earth system process understanding and so forth. So we have a number of um, activities where we develop technology solutions to facilitate this task. And um, the, the development of, this, um, of these solutions follows open science principles and is mostly open source. So we have two examples here. So in the first two boxes that you see on this slide, uh, the first is the Eurodata Cube that was, uh, and I was happy to see that it was mentioned also on, on Conrad's um, slides. So we're happy to, to see it used. So this is a platform that is integrating um, several services. It's a suite of services actually, um, but it's basically integrating uh, an engine for processing, processing very large archives uh, of the, or very large volumes of data. And this is the central hub with the Xcube uh, processing environment and libraries. And Xcube is uh, an open source Python package and toolkit that is uh, developed to provide um, EO data in analysis ready format. So basically X-ray uh, data sets. Uh, so the EDC provides, um, or the Eurodata Cube provides um, access to um, data, global archives of data that it's either uh, open like Copernicus or from commercial providers. Uh, this data comes in analysis ready format uh, and users can create um, data cubes from these um, data sets, uh, integrate their own uh, algorithms, um, define customized pipelines, so build applications and collaborate in uh, a, a workspace that we call a marketplace. Uh, now the second um, element, which is the one on the middle, is called the OpenEO platform. And this is a, a federated 
open environment that provides um, intuitive programming libraries to process uh, a wide variety of observation data sets. And the data access and processing is performed on multiple infrastructures. So this is why it's a federation and you can see the consortium on, on the, um, the picture that is, is on the slide. And all these infrastructures support the OpenEO API. This OpenEO API adds, acts as a translating interface. And there's one um, key aspect for um, the OpenEO platform that is it's providing an abstraction layer for the, um, un, to resolve the underlying complexity issues that come across um, uh, developing and implementing our subscription workflows. Um, the third element here is actually an initiative or an activity where we try to identify what are those um, common building blocks that can provide services through open interfaces and that can be used to build um, reusable um, exploitation platform ar architectures. So basically to build um, exploitation platforms that can be uh, later on federated. So it's aiming to provide an open source reference implementation of the architecture for exploitation platforms. Uh, next slide. All right, so um, in terms of reproducibility and collaboration, um, the capabilities that are provided by the platform environment, such as uh, the ones that I presented earlier, uh, support the development of research environments, um, either for dedicated communities. And here uh, is the picture uh, or the block on the middle, in the middle. So for dedicated communities, we uh, build um, tools and environments such as uh, the virtual labs, and these provide data and instruments that are specific to um, domains or to earth science um, uh, themes such as um, so, so teams that want to do atmospheric science, ocean science, cryosphere and so forth, or they can provide more um, generic capabilities for scientific workflows. Um, and this is the example that is on, on the left hand side with either deep um, earth system data lab. So this um, deep ESDL is actually based on uh, your data cube. So it uses the, your data cube as an engine and provides a Jupyter-based environment for um, collaborative development. And now we're adding additional machine learning libraries, um, options for version control, collaborative development, and, and many other, um, other features. Um, so moving towards um, the final element that is uh, linked more to the community or the community aspect of open science. Um, all these tools, um, we build them with the scientific community in mind, right? So um, in ESA um, EO, we introduced since a bit over one year, um, a concept of uh, science clusters. And uh, the science clusters are, um, or is an initiative to bring together teams um, and projects that are funded by ESA. And all these projects are either working together on, or have a common goal or complementary goals, uh, or could benefit from, from networking, so from collaborating. So we want to bring them together to facilitate their interaction, because we believe that um, uh, these projects could have together uh, achieve a greater goal than, than the sum of the parts, right? So um, we bring these projects together and we, we hope that they achieve results, but you also want to make sure that all the uh, science, product, science products that uh, come out of these projects are um, accessible, findable, uh, discoverable by the community. So we started to uh, work on, on a project where we try to um, catalog all the results that come out of the, um, out of the projects. So we look at an integrated approach to, to catalog and index these results and make them um, accessible as tech. Um, next. Yeah, two minutes. Sure. Uh, so community for us means more than just the, the scientific community. So we look also at the community at large, so the wider public, and we try to involve uh, the public into the scientific process, uh, grow awareness and build their skills, um, help them to use our data and our tools. So here we have an example of such an activity that contributes to, to this goal. It's called the EO dashboard, and this is a um, joint ESA and NASA JAXA collaboration uh, where we aim to uh, communicate um, information and knowledge about global changes based on the data that comes from uh, three agencies, so ESA, NASA, and JAXA. 
And I will just point out one of the um, collaborative aspects and the open science aspects um, of this project, uh, which is to engage um, the public in public the public in competitions. Uh, we had a hackathon uh, last year in June, uh, 2021, and we provided the participants with access to um, hosted uh, managed workspaces. Again, we're using the Eurodata Cube for this. Uh, these workspaces are based on Jupyter, and we provided them, um, um, let's say, an integrated environment with all the uh, dependencies, pre-installed credentials, pre-installed prepared as, as environment variables, and we enabled them to um, access all the open data, all the open tools uh, that we make available on this um, EO dashboard to write and execute their own um, applications as um, uh, Python uh, applications and store them in Jupyter notebooks and submit their contributions um, in the same environment. Uh, so with this, I will uh, conclude my presentation and yeah, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, again, there's going to be a, a lot of questions and follow up on uh, some of that collaboration that I know we're doing um, between at least uh, NASA and ESA, a lot of good work there. So thank you, uh, Klaus and Anka. Um, so that closes actually our um, the presentations coming from our, our non-NASA data processing centers, but this, this does open up the fishbowl discussion where we have a, the Q&A session. So I see Natasha has turned on her camera. Um, so I hope our guests are able to stick around for some questions from our uh, system architecture working group. Uh, you're still on mute, Natasha. It's weird, it says you're not on mute. <laughs> Don't worry, this, it's been happening to everyone all day. <laughs> Conrad got to see all of our uh, inner workings this morning. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, um, it's registering headphones, weird. Um, well, okay, so I apologize to speakers in advance. I'm gonna popcorn around just to make sure we have some variety from speakers. So the questions may be a little bit out of order. We, we may jump from topic to topic. Um, but I'm going to start with Uzair, and I apologize if I pronounce your name incorrectly. Um, across NASA projects, development and processing costs are funded and tracked separately. Um, across MGOs, how are costs for each mission tracked separately? Yeah, uh, uh, the government of India uh, funds each of the projects and uh, uh, each mission, uh, the resource requirements are uh, pre-known. So before the mission itself. So uh, we project the requirements uh, to the government and we get the funds allocation. So uh, basically uh, I'm not into the budgeting domain. I'm more into technical side. I may not be uh, able to answer you correctly, but uh, uh, I'll connect you the uh, concerned persons. So. I think I think the question here is more about like within this system you have, you know, obviously there's costs associated with data and so is everybody paying like does each mission just have its own separate instantiation or is there some kind of cost accounting cost management. That's built into the system so that projects could be tracked for their specific yeah. use. Uh, actually, there's a uh, policy uh, which uh, specified that uh, specifies that uh, data uh, above a particular uh, resolution th threshold it is uh, free and uh, openly available to all. But uh, uh, data which belongs to a particular data resolution, it uh, uh, it has to it has to be a paid product. So uh, that way we are differentiating based on the resolution of data. Okay, and that's for the user's cost, but what about for like the different missions that have to pay for processing on the system? Does, does that question make sense? Like if you had two different missions that were trying to use this system, is each yes. one just creating its own deployment and then paying no, no, for its own deployment? Or is there like shared services that then they pay something? It's a basically a, a, a shared environment where the resources are commonly shared. Uh, uh, for example, for data acquisition, uh, we have around uh, seven to eight uh, data acquisition servers. So, and they cater to around uh, uh, 20 to 23 satellites on a daily basis. So resources are shared across missions. 
So it's nothing like a, a particular machine or particular infrastructure is dedicated to one mission. So it's a, a, a collaborative and a, a shared resource. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump down for Francesco. Um, is there a long-term archive that you have to deliver the data to? If so, what is the scope of the archive versus the scope of the data system? And who is responsible for serving public users? Um, is the funding separate for these two entities? Is Francesco able to come off mute? Okay, I'm going to assume that you can't come off mute. So I'll ask, uh, I see Conrad sitting here. So I'll ask Conrad. Um, with respect to the objectives, um, centralized data, but also um, there's the objective of centralized data, but also the realization that there will be um, federation. For the federated side, where do you see the future um, to bring, uh, bring the data to your system for processing or move the processing to the data? I definitely uh, value moving the, uh, the processing to the data. So the federated, for, let me do a specific example. So let's say you want to kind of uh, train a neural network and uh, maybe you don't want to release all the data if you are a corporation, for example, uh, in raw format, but maybe uh, using AI methods, you can maybe just uh, compress them and also only provide the features, right? So that could be a way of uh, that the data stays close where it is, and then you move either very little data to your processing or you do pre-processing on the systems. So I think there won't be a one-stop shop solution. It's very much will depend on the um, kind of on the problem you have at hand. But this API I mentioned earlier, if we get this platform independent, people can just develop corresponding processing schemes independent of the platform. Uh, to uh, to get this done, to have insights from various platforms which host different data, which doesn't need to get shipped raw from one to the other. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, is Anka on? Because I have a couple questions. You are great. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, one of the topics that has come up. Um, for us with the open science is quality control, right? NASA has a requirement that like, hey, if we're gonna call this a NASA product, we've, we verify that it is of a certain quality. And so how do you implement quality control on your community contributions um, in this respect, in your system? Actually, I think um, this is something that Klaus can answer because they handle this on the PAL. So there is a peer review on the PAL. I don't know, Klaus, if you wanna give some details on that. Yes, so I, I, it's, it's not implemented yet, but we follow the same, the same way we already do now. So if you take, for example, a mission today, scientists develop an algorithm, they have to test it against some uh, test data sets. And then there's a committee at ESA who decides if the algorithm that has been proposed by the scientists will be implemented or not. And the, this will not change. So the, the, the thing that will change is that scientists have the possibility to validate the algorithms themselves on the map. So they have access to all the ground data that is used for validation and they will deliver a report and this report will then be reviewed at ESA by a committee and the ESA decides uh, if then these, these changes are accepted or not. So in, in terms of uh, the procedure, I think things do not change. They only change in the way we handle them internally. So people can test their own algorithms. They don't have to submit something to ease and we do the test, but they can do it themselves. Um, once it's accepted, then the, the, the changes can be ingested directly because uh, um, the, the, the scientists have, have access to the operational code. So they directly do their changes in the operational code. So we can directly ingest in these changes and we don't need uh, a software company doing the implementation for the scientists. So that is, but, but in terms of quality control, I think nothing changes. There is, just, just to complete the answer, there is one more aspect that we're looking at uh, more from the application side, right? So when we um, make the data accessible as analysis ready data through data cubes, 
um, usually, or in many of the cases, data suffer some transformation, right, from the original product, if we put it on the same grid with other data. Um, so we have to make sure that, um, and, and this is still an open topic, so this is still a challenge, and we, we don't have a, a solution for this, but we have to make sure that um, all the transformations are then recorded so that we have traceability on the data, uh, and that the, the metadata gets gets updated and reflects these changes um, to, to permit later on also error propagation and things like this. So this is something that we're considering, but we're, we're still looking into solutions for this. Great, yeah, thank you. And I think that hit on a lot of questions we had about metadata and provenance and you know those kind of standards. Um, so I'm gonna jump back up here um, to Azair. Um, so your architecture showed a product validation, and this is kind of, in line function after the products are produced. Is that an automated process, for example, through AI? Um, and if so, can you describe that? Yeah, it's a, a actually a, a mix of automated and interactive processes. So uh, there are certain uh, parameters which, validate, which we validate in an automated way, like uh, pixel dropouts, line losses, but uh, uh, there are certain uh, limitations to the uh, automated quality checks. So, uh, so uh, after the uh, once the automated quality checks verify the uh, 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 the product, it goes for a manual and interactive quality check. So, uh, where uh, we check the all the uh, geometric and radiometric fidelities of the product. So, uh, it's a basically a mix of both, automated as well as interactive. And who's doing that manual process? Is that um, sort of in-house staff science yeah, team? Yeah, we have a quality control team, uh, which is an in-house uh, group of people. Great, thank you. Um, Francesco, are you able to unmute? I'm just, I just wanna check in with you again. No. Okay, um, maybe you've signed off. So Conrad, um, in the data cube generation, was that mainly done on premise in high performance computing or was it in the cloud? Um, were there some challenges faced in the data movement from remote data archives into an on-premise system and any challenges or lessons learned in data management for data cube generation? Okay, so there's multiple facets to that question. So the first one is, um, yeah, we uh, so this data cube implementation, the key value store where you have an index uh, that indexes your spatial temporal information, and then the value has, for example, a small patch of 32 by 32 pixels. Um, the pair system this this was running on the cloud and uh, in a HPC cluster, so it works on both ends. And what is the challenge? So there's of course, dedicated ingestion engines that need to do the reprojection and alignment. No? So, for example, if you have um, MODIS data on the 250 meter resolution versus um, Sentinel on the 30, 10 meter resolution, uh, these grids in the data cube get aligned to each other. So, if the, the higher resolution gets just subs within the four subpixels, so all of these are kind of aligned. And this, of course, needs uh, a picking a certain projection and then also doing an interpolation of the data. So you could say, ah, it's not the original data anymore. Um, but I think for most deep learning um, cases, that is fine. And you can also um, hypersample um, beyond the Nyquist frequency and then you're good kind of. But again, as I said, it's more like to be considered a cache for this deep learning approaches. The raw data still stays in the warm storage as raw files and then it can be re-ingested into a different kind of data cube. So one challenge is maybe you might have to need to re-ingest for different applications, but the good thing is it's just a temporary um, kind of hot cache that you use specifically. It's 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 really, we, we, re, we are really motivated by that layered hierarchy of tape, archive, long-term, warm storage on this, and then this hot data cubes if it comes to um, heavy number structure. Did I miss any aspect of the question? Yeah, and I know that was a loaded question. And I apologize, I'm reading from another monitor over here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and I think just to catch the first part. So you were saying that, I, I think, can you just repeat, um, are you doing the data cube generation on on-prem supercomputing or are you doing that in the cloud? 
in both. There's uh, options to have it in both. And in the cloud, it's maybe not as agile and as performant uh, because it, there's a Docker wrapper around and the data is maybe less close uh, to this processing engine. But in principle, that's just, it's simply a trade-off between speed and uh, maybe convenience and scalability of the cloud uh, when, when you compare it to the HPC. But both work. Uh, so the, the, the system isn't kind of tied to one or the other paradigm. Do you, are there any decisions in like, like what's happening to make the decision to go to cloud? I mean, it can go to either, but one of the things that's come up in the last two days is cost, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, what, what mechanisms do you have in place to decide, okay, this goes to cloud or this goes, is it solely based on the person who's triggering the system or is there an automation happening? Yeah, I, I would again say this very much depends on uh, your environment. For example, for DLR, for the German Aerospace Center, there was the decision to say, we go with a, a partnership with uh, the Leibniz Supercomputing Center, then there is a contract, and then it can be, that's definitely for us more efficient to then consolidate and outsource all of our compute resources to uh, the Terabyte Pro Initiative with LRC, or most of them related to AI, uh, and keep them kind of consolidated. That pushes down the cost of having a lot of scattered projects within the German Aerospace Center that everyone cooks his own soup, kind of, and so it's consolidated. That pushes down the cost. But on the other hand, if you just want to experiment and want to get your hands on, maybe you start with the cloud solution and just see if the general workflow uh, works well. I, I would say, I'm sorry to say that's a political answer, but it very much depends on your setting. In our case, uh, for the um, German Aerospace Center, the decision was simply to consolidate compute resources into one data center, and that makes it more cost efficient. Yeah, and that makes sense, right? In architectures, people and processes, which includes yeah. politics. So um, <laughs> I'm going to jump down to Klaus. Uh, you showed the various systems and efforts, such as Euro Data Cube, Open EO, and EO EPCA. Is there an overarching design and multi project coordination across all these systems? And were there any challenges faced or lessons learned in coordinating across these many systems? Right, yeah, so I think that's a question for me. So um, the, let's say the core coordination framework is the EOEPCA. So the common architecture is, is trying to bring all these elements together, right? So that's, that's where we're trying to, or through this initiative, we're looking to, to build those um, open source building blocks that are able to communicate through open interfaces and that can be reused to create or to, to help build new platforms that would then be able to be federated, right? So it's, um, it, it's a common, <laughs> common architecture, the, the name says it also. That is the initiative that is trying to bring these elements together. And we are working uh, closely with um, partners such as OGC to, um, to advance on the standardization and interoperability. Great, thank you so much. Um, Uzair, I'm gonna um, hop back up to you. Um, so there's a lot of interest in this on-demand system because I think that's come up for us as part of the open science component um, in our conversations. And so the question is, will the on-demand system be accessible by public users? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it will be accessible to uh, users. So uh, uh, we are ca will be catering to a different variety of users, uh, like uh, novice users and advanced users. For uh, novice users, like uh, those who are not much conversant with the uh, programming languages and all, so we will be keeping uh, pre-built models. So uh, they just have to choose the data and feed into the pre-built model. So, they, uh, so that they get the ready-made outputs and uh, they can download the outputs. Uh, another uh, category of users are advanced users who are conversant with the programming languages. So uh, through uh, Jupyter Notebooks and all, we'll be providing them a, a development platform so they can write their own code and uh, use our infrastructure to process data and download the final results. So it will cat cater to a, a wide variety of users and definitely it will be open to public. 
Great. And can I just follow up on a couple of things there? So I think, and this goes back to one of your previous comments about costing. So that means that when the user goes to download, that's yeah. when they would pay costs if it was, let's say, at a finer resolution or something like that for that on-demand component? Uh, no, currently uh, uh, we are releasing the on-demand processing for the uh, free and open data sets only. So users will be able to do use ODP uh, and use only the uh, uh, freely available data products, not the priced ones. So uh, in the in the uh, first release, so later policy may arrive, uh, we may go on for paid products also, but initially it will be uh, utilizing the uh, free data products only. Okay, great. And then um, just one more follow on to that, which is how did you get around any cybersecurity issues? And is that just because of the reduced resolution or were, are there any other cybersecurity issues in consideration for this on demand? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, cybersecurity issues are there, but uh, uh, we have uh, uh, handled them in the design itself. So uh, 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 we, uh, we are uh, following an architecture, software architecture. We are wherein we are not exposing our data directly to the uh, uh, users. Uh, we, uh, we are allowing data access through uh, only the certain gateways and APIs. So there is no direct access to the database. Uh, only our own service can uh, access the data. So it is handled in the design itself. And moreover, whatever web applications we are developing, uh, uh, they have to go through a stringent uh, uh, cybersecurity checks, like uh, we have Acunetics scan. So every, any web, web application that is going to be deployed over web, it has to conform to the uh, 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 specifications. So uh, it has to go through a Acunetics scan and there's a committee which has to clear the application to be deployed. So uh, there's a team of cybersecurity experts which verifies the uh, applications. And once they say go ahead, then only those are deployed. And just to be clear, the on-demand products that are being generated are sort of like pre-baked um, algorithms for the, generating those higher demand products. The advanced users aren't able to modify those algorithms. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. correct. Okay, cool. Um, so Conrad, I see you kind of jumped off the window, but I see you're still there. So I'm going to jump back down to you. Um, you mentioned leveraging traditional high-performance computing and public cloud in AWS um, in your architecture approach. Do you see hybrid cloud plus cloud approach continuing in the long term, or will it go on the cloud entirely at some point? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, um, I can't predict the future. I see um, the cloud has the advantage of being scalable and uh, you can just sort of ramp up your services and ramp them down. So let's say cloud is very good, I would say, for maybe um, processing in parallel on the fly mission data, for example. But when it comes to um, high performance, uh, let's say, distributed model training for AI, so far, at least, I feel the HPC approach is uh, still a valuable one. But I, we have this discussion with Leibniz Supercomputing Center, how to integrate both uh, and uh, exploit the benefits. Uh, um, yeah, yeah I, I cannot give a definite answer, but uh, HPC for scientific numbers crunching is still very valuable, in particular when it comes to data very close to compute. Great, so still need some kind of like mechanism to go back and forth here of figuring out. I heard somebody I jump know. in here. Andy, yes, are we at time? Andy. Um, if you could have maybe five more minutes and I think uh, Francesco is online. So if you wanted to circle back to him with your question, I think. Oh, great. Um, I will do that. Um, so uh, I'm just I'm just looking to see which of the three questions if we only have five minutes. Um, so it seems like the SOC and MADS are designed for multi-mission use. Um, are there any lessons learned on managing and tracking of usage and costs for different missions? For example, tracking um, in multi-mission processing storage and applications. Well, yes. Uh... The, 
uh, used to um, design uh, the uh, ground segment dedicated to the mission, of course, while uh, for us it's important to deliver data uh, level, uh, higher level data uh, in a multi-mission environment. So uh, the effort uh, is to uh, implement so this multi-mission environment because we strongly believe that uh, the possibility to put together data uh, from uh, um, microwaves uh, or hyperspectra like Prisma data uh, could be uh, generate very uh, innovative uh, application. Of course, when you put together multi-mission data, you have to face a lot of problem because um, generally speaking, these data don't simply match together. So one of the steps ahead is uh, uh, to first uh, uh, start with basic application uh, and we look this application also for user community for co-registration um, to put uh, a common uh, value of different mission to be comparable and uh, uh, we hope uh, to uh, collect this application we want to collect this basic application and put it to the higher level in order to be used to the whole community of our user and improve in this way the possibility to use data in a multi-mission manner. Okay, great. And just to kind of come back to this cost and tracking, I mean, if you have multiple missions that are generating sort of a, a, a mission mashup or a data integration, who's paying for that? Or how do you how does that get sort of earmarked within the system? Uh, basically, um, the most of uh, our mission uh, are uh, devoted to research activities. Uh, so uh, we can reserve uh, some space for institutional or some research institute. But uh, if uh, some user wants to uh, make the uh, um, higher um, uh, processing uh, uh, with uh, higher resource because in most of cases we need to put a cap on the amount of resources that user can uh, each user can use. If this cap uh, needs to be overcome, we need to go to the public cloud in order to manage this extra uh, resource requirement. And in this case, the user needs to pay the public cloud in order to. Uh, have these uh, extra and uh, uh, extra re requirement of resources. Great. I think, um, Andy, just to be respectful of time, um, I think that's a good stopping point. Um, it looks like everybody's doing a good job of um, keeping up in the chat. So, perfect. Okay. Um, again, I want to thank all of our presenters that we've had so far. I know that the, the time difference is an issue, and I really appreciate you guys taking the, the guys and gals taking the opportunity to join in here. Very, very good discussions. Uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, so if everyone could rejoin um, on the hour, I'd say, or a minute after the hour, uh, we will kick off our next session, which uh, will be run by Luke Dow. Uh, thank you, everyone. And again, uh, if you have a chance, check the chat. Natasha has put some uh, information on there of how you can participate virtually. Thanks, everyone. See you in a little bit. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name's Luke Dahl. We'll go ahead and get started. Our next session is going to be uh, a number of presentations on non-Earth science mission processing architectures. So I'm very excited to have the, the inclusion of, of some of these, uh, these teams. We are going to start today with uh, KT Lim from the uh, Slack National Accelerator Lab. KT is the data management software architect for the Vera C Rubin Observatory. Uh, prior to that, KT has worked on big data at startups and internet scale uh, sized companies. And uh, KT holds a PhD in computational chemistry from Caltech. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And uh, thank you, KT. Make sure I unmute. There we go. Uh, thank you very Sad. much for this opportunity. Um, and I'll uh, talk a little bit about open source and Ruben data management and go through some of the 
uh, the architecture and some of the issues that I, I was uh, drawing out of the survey and even some of the conversation from the, the last session. Um, let me, hold on, slow up the right window here. Okay, go. Uh, so a little bit about the Verisi Rubin Observatory and the legacy survey of space and time that it will be conducting. Um, the key science drivers for this are to uh, study dark matter, dark energy, uh, Milky Way structure and formation, cataloging the solar system, and exploring the transient sky. Um, what's very interesting about this is these are very different kinds of science. Um, they're all looking up rather than down. Uh, so it's the uh, astronomical sky versus uh, looking down at the Earth. Um, but uh, we can take one data set um, by surveying the entire sky multiple times and taking essentially a movie of the whole sky um, in the visible and near infrared that will give us uh, the data that's necessary to actually answer questions in all of these different science areas that range from very close asteroids in the solar system um, and trans-Neptunian objects, whatever, out to the extremely distant uh, cosmological questions about how the universe came to be and what dark matter and dark energy are. So the observatory is composed of uh, the Simoni Survey Telescope, uh, which has the LSST camera mounted on it. It has an 8.4 meter primary mirror, 3.2 gigapixel camera uh, with six different filter bands, as I said, spinning from uh, the through the visible range primarily and a little bit into the IR. Uh, the legacy survey of space and time that the telescope will actually uh, perform will last for 10 years. It will cover more than 18,000 square degrees of sky uh, that we can view from the site in Chile. Uh, and we'll have more than 825 visits or images of any given point on the sky within that 18,000 square degrees. Um, it's currently in, under construction, uh, but we are actually already starting pre-operations uh, with some of the auxiliary instrumentation and commissioning of com various components of the system um, and starting to integrate uh, the system. And operations is currently scheduled to start in early 2024. And you can see the rendering that, uh, that was done many years ago on the left and the actual reality from December of 2021 on the right uh, as the, the dome is completed uh, and there's a telescope actually, and the telescope uh, is actually fully assembled inside. Um, the mirrors are not yet on it. So uh, cameras are not yet on it. That will be coming later this year. So that's the, the hardware, which is of interest to some people, but uh, I'm mostly interested in the data management system, which is actually quite complex. Uh, we have to take the raw data that's coming from the camera, which is approximately 20 terabytes of data a night. Uh, it's actually compressible, so it, it's less in terms of actual storage. Um, but that's the sequential images approximately every 30 seconds covering the entire visible sky. And we're doing a number of things with it. One of it is we, one of them is generating prompt data products. These include alerts. We expect up to 10 million alerts per night um, that are the result of processing the images and determining whether anything has changed in them. And we are required, um, or we're, our goal is to issue those alerts with, uh, within 60 seconds after the image has been taken. So this is near real-time processing. Of, um, of images and taking measurements on them and, uh, and comparing them with, um, with what we know is already in the sky. Uh, those alert streams will go out to community brokers and via them to the public and to, uh, to other telescopes that can follow up any alert that, um, that comes out. And there's a complex system of uh, filtering and uh, scheduling that goes on uh, for that follow-up observation. Within 24 hours, we will uh, publish a prom products database that includes detailed measurements of all the things um, that we've seen in the images and in particular things that have changed. Um, and on an annual basis, we will reprocess all the images that we've taken to date. Um, so each year it becomes uh, linearly more difficult to do this. Uh, we have one year in the first year, two years in the second year, et cetera. Um, but we still have one year to do the processing. Uh, and those annual data releases uh, will be published. Uh, they'll be so they will be scientifically consistent. Um, they'll all be using the same software, and uh, they will um, uh, include improvements to that software over time. So the prompt products and the data releases will be published via data access centers. We have uh, one in the U.S., one in Chile, uh, one in France, and one in the United Kingdom. 
Um, there are also for the data release, the, uh, the French and United Kingdom uh, data facilities will also help us process that data um, the, the, at the large scale that we need. And we'll also have independent data access centers uh, that are in, in other countries and uh, around the world uh, that will serve specialized needs for particular kinds of science users uh, or in, in particular places. Most or many of those data access centers will run the LS, or actually, hmm, this is a little bit outdated. Uh, I should say Ruben Science Platform. Uh, it does in the, the graphic, but not in the text. Um, and this is a combination of different aspects uh, to serve science uh, exploratory and analytical science uses. Um, it includes a portal aspect for scanning through the data, notebooks that allow ad hoc analysis, and web APIs that allow uh, automated access to the data. And that underneath then has the data releases, the alert filtering service, user databases, user files, user computing, all available uh, resources for science users to, to come to the data and interact with it at our data access centers um, and with a, a variety of software tools. So I will talk about all this uh, whole ecosystem a little bit more, um, but to start with the open science, the data is world public after a two-year period. Prior to that, it's available to data rights holders, which are fairly extensive, includes all astronomers from the US and Chile and designated individuals from international partners. Um, science collaborations allow sharing of data, code, and knowledge between data rights holders and the independent data access center, as I mentioned. We also have an education and public outreach program, which provides lessons, curated explorations, and citizen science opportunities. Generally, this will extract data from the, the data access centers uh, and republish it in public facing um, systems. Uh, the data access centers are always authenticated. Um, they do not, it, it is possible for independent scientists and independent members of the public uh, to potentially be approved for access to the data access centers, but generally they would, uh, public goes through the public outreach systems instead. Uh, Science Pipelines Code, I won't talk too much about this, but we have a, a large uh, and growing uh, system of algorithms to process the images and take measurements on them. And I wanted to take a bit more time to emphasize uh, this slide. Uh, the principles kind of, of open source that we kind of go uh, by. Partly this is because uh, I mean, there, open source is not just publishing code or using particular technology components. It's really a culture. And so um, all of our code is published in public repositories on GitHub. All the binary artifacts are public as well, of course. Uh, but we also have a developer guide. This defines standards and processes for internal and external developers, uh, which helps to welcome external contributions. Um, and uh, we also have a public forum that anybody can join, not just data rights holders, but, but anybody at all, um, for users and developers to interact with the project staff. Uh, so to ask questions, to, uh, to self-help, um, and to... And to um, to get information on how the, the actual uh, software and services work. Our user-facing services uh, comply with IVOA standards whenever possible. This is the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. Uh, so they define uh, standards for querying catalogs, for retrieving images, and for doing processing of those images. Uh, Third-party dependencies are provided by the ContaForge ecosystem, which is, uh, again, public. Uh, and. Um, open source whenever possible. Uh, we use uh, pypi.org for Python packages, if not, uh, and internal forks of external packages only when absolutely necessary. Um, and so bug, in particular, with regard to that, bug fixes that we make for our dependencies and for the other services that we use, we try to push them upstream whenever possible so that we are feeding back to the, the overall open source ecosystem. Um, and so, Part of the culture is also to you know, even just to kind of celebrate when staff get bug fixes or features incorporated into those upstream systems um, so that people are incentivized to do that, even though it's not work directly on packages that are with, um, uh, within the Ruben ecosystem. Data processing infrastructure may use proprietary products if non-proprietary alternatives can also be used, possibly at lower performance. So this is um, if we wanted to use Oracle as a database, for example, uh, we could, as long as we're not using uh, particular aspects of Oracle that, um, that cannot be also reproduced in something else like Postgres. Um, and very internal systems, things like bug tracking, document management, uh, 
you know, just the, the hardware switches that we use, et cetera, uh, all of those can be proprietary because we expect they're, they're a relatively commodity. Um, so other aspects of the open source culture, I think, that are important are uh, to interact closely with people who are maintainers of key systems uh, like Honda Forge. Um, we, are, we actually have um, uh, one of the Honda Forge maintainers is, uh, is part of the, the Dark Energy Science Collaboration and, and works with us on our, our code and, um, quite frequently and vice versa. Um, and also at being uh, responsive in our community forum to answering newbie questions uh, and using those answers uh, once they're produced to improve the documentation so that everybody can benefit from them. Okay, what is this data management system that we're building? Uh, so uh, as I said, we have to take the data from the summit. Uh, it first uh, passes where a lot of it passes through the base, uh, which is a data center in La Serena, Chile, um, at the base of the mountain, uh, next to the ocean actually, um, that has, uh, uh, repositories for real-time telemetry uh, does also has a, a backup archive of the raw data um, and has local science platforms for uh, use by the commissioning team and by uh, uh, scientists in Chile. Uh, we have a data backbone that communicates that archive data uh, to the US data facility, which will be located at the Slack National Accelerator Lab. Um, we also have a prompt feed that uh, that handles the, the near real-time processing um, and then does alert distribution from that. Uh, I think one thing that's been mentioned around here before is quality control and quality assurance. Uh, we will have automated quality control services that run within the pipelines uh, to generate metrics um, and uh, also that, have, that may also have additional pipelines that, that execute on them to, to summarize those metrics. Um, we will have, in addition, uh, humans that are looking at the, the data, both the metrics that are coming off, as well as uh, spot checking the data to make sure that it's of appropriate quality before it gets released. And that applies to both um, the nightly, the nightly processing and the alerts are almost all automated. We expect uh, the data releases will have a lot more manual components to them. And then finally, uh, on the right, you have the UK data facility and the French data facility that are doing some of our data release processing. And then all of this goes out to the science community through the data access centers. So the computing environments here, uh, we have the summit in the base uh, that have uh, the uh, control systems and rapid analysis, the prompt processing for alerts, as I said, uh, at the US data facility. Um, there are some security restrictions that have been uh, imposed upon us uh, to embargo the raw images and, uh, and some of the measurements uh, during a particular embargo period uh, after which they're released to the science community. Uh, the annual data release pr uh, processing works on on-premises systems at the USDF French data facility and UK data facility. Um, some of that uh, at each data facility will be on multi-tenant shared computing and storage infrastructure. Um, so we're trying to um, be good citizens at each place and make use of uh, shared resources where possible. And then the data access centers, uh, the US data access center, we're currently specifying that it will be in the public cloud, um, possibly with on-premises backend services because storage of very large amounts of data, we're talking uh, in the, by the end of the survey, we're talking hundreds of petabytes of data. Um, storage of that in the public cloud is still relatively expensive. Uh, so we're expecting to store that at our data facility and have backend services there um, that feed the public cloud. And of course, as I mentioned, uh, we also have international partners that have data access centers. We've developed custom LSST middleware, uh, as, which has uh, a few components. A data butler handles IO and metadata. Uh, it's essentially responsible for retrieving the data uh, and making it available to algorithmic code in, in memory in Python uh, friendly formats. So it maintains a central database of the, the data sets that are available and then includes provenance. Um, and when we execute batch jobs, uh, the batch jobs run independently, uh, but at the end of each workflow, we merge information about the data that, that has been generated, the data products that have been generated by those batch jobs into the data butler database. Uh, a pipeline task, uh, abstraction handles configuration and science task execution. 
Uh, this uh, allows us to abstract over various uh, execution systems. And then the batch production service abstracts, uh, sorry, the batch production service abstracts over the underlying workflow execution systems. These might include, uh, well, I'll go into a little bit of detail about what, uh, what kinds of execution systems we're talking about later. So this is designed to be reusable across astronomical instruments in particular. Um, we're using it for the Subaru Hyper Supreme Chem uh, Telescope in Hawaii, uh, the Dark Energy Camera, which is uh, a, a separate project, and also others, um, and potentially beyond uh, even astronomy for other things that are doing kind of, uh, similar kinds of image processing. But it's not really designed as a multi-tenant system um, where you can have multiple instruments all in the same uh, data, data Butler repository, um, but it's not designed for different projects with uh, isolation between them necessarily. Um, and one of the projects that I should mention that Gregory was going to talk about is uh, SphereX, which is a uh, satellite um, that NASA is working on that's also doing astronomical observations and uh, they have baselined the use of uh, our middleware uh, and in that project. So it's a, a good example of reuse. Um, technology choices. The data backbone uh, for movement and management. Uh, we are currently baselining Rusio, which is uh, from the high energy physics community. We know this is something that can work at the kinds of scales. We're talking billions of files and petabytes of data um, that, that we need. And so we will be using that to, to move data between the various data facilities uh, across the international wide area networks. Um, we won't be using it. We don't think we're going to be using it for the prompt data because it, that needs to be extremely low latency. Uh, we need to move data within seconds, uh, ideally even start uh, things in milliseconds. Um, so Recio is not appropriate for that. For workflow management and job execution, we're using Panda, which also comes from the high energy physics uh, community, uh, Parcel, which is uh, something from the dark energy uh, collaboration, uh, HD Condor, which is very common, of course, in uh, high throughput uh, computing um, realms, which is uh, where we are, and Slurm as well. Uh, for relational databases, we use uh, primarily Postgres, uh, and, and we have a custom shared nothing distributed database that we're expecting to use for our very large scale catalogs of all the objects and uh, in the sky, <laughs> uh, tens of uh, and uh, tens of billions of uh, stars and galaxies, and uh, many uh, up to a thousand measurements of each of them. So that's uh, a lot of rows. Um, we use uh, NoSQL database internally for uh, the um, for, for handling the alert system, and we use, so we're using Cassandra for that. Uh, we have time series databases primarily for uh, things like telemetry, but also for our metric systems, um, for analyzing the metrics that are coming from the pipelines. Uh, so we use InfluxDB and Chronograph and in general the tick stack uh, for that. Uh, for messaging, we're primarily using Apache Kafka. Uh, within the data management system. On, on the summit for the, the control systems, we use something different, but um, for the data management, it's, for, it's Kafka. And science platform, uh, we're using Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Lab uh, as the basis. And then we pull into that um, uh, many other astronomical and other packages uh, that are necessary. For infrastructure choices, for service management. Warning. We use... Let's give you a two minute warning, KT. Yep, almost done, uh, I think. Uh, so for service management, we use Kubernetes and Argo CD. And storage, we try to be agnostic. We are deployed on both S3 compatible object stores and uh, shared POSIX file systems um, and can use either one uh, transparently to the, the algorithms. So adaptability. Um, this is, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about how we get in new algorithms um, from the community and how, how we interact with the science community in general. So we have a public process um, to determine the best of breed algorithms and services in key areas uh, and for things like the alert brokers, for how we compute photo photometric redshifts uh, and for, for potentially other algorithms within the science uh, pipelines. And we have a pluggable measurement framework that allows for that kind of future expansion. We've already uh, in the course of uh, development changed the point spread function model and the deep blending algorithm. And uh, we have, um, so community provided modifications or new algorithms can be incorporated into the next year's data release because we're doing this on an annual cycle. Um, we can take in new algorithms, um, vet them, make sure that they're uh, well integrated and, and won't cause other things to crash, uh, and then run them in the, the next year's data release. 
And uh, we can also incorporate them into the alert production as it's running um, continuously. Uh, On-demand product generation, we have image services that are based on the IVOA uh, SODA um, standard to generate cutouts, mosaics, co-eds, and other specified virtual data products on demand. Uh, and then science users can apply general purpose compute resources in the data access centers to produce their own user generated data products, uh, which can be shared within work groups or made public. Um, and they're federated with the catalogs that we already have. Um, but they are distinct uh, as user generated data products. We do not, of course, uh, provide any uh, certification of quality or anything like that. If the algorithms got moved into the data release, then we would at that point uh, uh, certify them as, uh, as being of our standards. And then finally, a couple other implementation issues, uh, cybersecurity, um, isolating the science users in the public cloud away from the processing clusters and the backend services helps to mitigate many issues that we have with identity management and security. Um, and essentially the, 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 the interface to the, the data and the archives uh, becomes much, much more narrow and, uh, and is more easily secured. And then system efficiency uh, was mentioned also. Uh, there are definite concerns about overhead for file transfer, for job startup and things like that um, with complex metadata and, and, uh, and complex middleware systems. Um, but we, we are, what we're trying to do is observe where bottlenecks occur and implement optimizations uh, in, in those specific areas. Uh, those have sometimes given 10 to 100 times speed ups for certain items. Um, and hopefully it's lower cost than trying to optimize everything up front. Um, premature optimization is often problematic, and so we've been trying to avoid that. Um, and that's it. And I think I made it by 11.25. Excellent. Thank you, KT. A very nice presentation. I, I'm sure the working group's going to have a number of questions for you after uh, this, this session concludes. We move into the Q&A, so stick around and uh, we'll, we'll take it, bring it, bring it back in just a few minutes. All right, I do want to make a quick announcement. Um, I think we mentioned uh, Gregory Dubois Felsman was un unfortunately um, had a, a personal issue to deal with today. So we, we are going to have a gap in our agenda after our next speaker. So we'll, we'll likely have a little bit of a longer break for those of you that are still trying to uh, answer Slack messages and emails and, and, and pay attention. So um, next up, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Megan Sosi from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Megan is the Data Management System Technical Lead for the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. Uh, and she leads the design and the development of the system that will process, archive, and serve out to the astronomical and public community all of the observations taken using the Nancy, Groman, uh, Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. She's worked at the Space Telescope Science Institute for 23 years and has contributed to the Hubble and James Webb Space Telescope missions as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Megan. Yeah, thank you. You all can uh, see and hear me and the slides are clear. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm kind of excited to talk a little bit about Nancy Grace Roman. Um, we're, we just started active development of it recently. so. Uh, the Roman Telescope is a NASA observatory. It's designed to look at and study dark energy, dark matter, um, search for and image exoplanets, and explore other topics in infrared astrophysics. Uh, it's primarily a survey mission, um, but 25% of the time is going to be devoted to general astrophysics surveys. So the data management system that we have has to be able to support the specific science behind the large survey teams as well as the um, general observers whose science we don't necessarily know a priori. Um, and some of the factors that help constrain our data management system include uh, the Roman mission itself is executing with both a cost and schedule constrained timeline. So we are a cost cap mission. Um, we're currently scheduled to launch the observatory in October of 26. Uh, but ground testing for the major instrumentation is scheduled to begin next year. So the SOC archive, uh, that's at Space Telescope, has to be ready to accept that ground data and store it in its archive for later reference by this time. The mission also has a segregated ground system. So the Mission Operations Center is being controlled by Goddard Space Flight. Um, the science data processing, however, is shared between the Science Operations SOC which is located at Space Telescope and the Science Support Center that's located at Caltech, IPAC. 
Um, and we're also going to have survey related analysis that's required to meet the mission goals performed by openly competed and selected science teams from the general astronomical community. The DMS system is going to be operating with a hybrid cloud and on premises system. Uh, this helps us create synergy with some of the existing James Webb and Space Telescope multi-mission archive functionalities and user interfaces that we have. Uh, it also helps us to leverage some of the multi-mission software, uh, infrastructure, personnel expertise and experience uh, with the tools that we use and, and develop and provide to the community. And this in turn helps facilitate the system development, meeting the tight schedule and cost guidelines that we do have for the mission. And this hybrid architecture um, also helps us achieve some very specific uh, mission goals and requirements that have been levied on the system. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. DMS itself is going to be expected to process, store, and serve a very large volume of data for astronomy. Um, that system needs to be able to process and reprocess, store, ser and serve that data multiple times over. Uh, the processing itself has timing requirements, not as strict as Ruben, um, but for each data level, we'll have a set amount of hours, days that we have to process and provide the data to the community. And these timing requirements are um, levied uh, for both us and IPAC. So overall, we have to do it within a set amount of time. The telescope itself has two main instrumentation packages. There's the WFI imager, it consists of 18 4K by 4K infrared um, detectors. And each time an exposure is taken on board, all of those detectors are recording data. The other uh, instrumentation package is the chronographic imager. It's a technology demonstration. And so while we're getting data for both of these um, packages down, there is gonna be split processing between us and SSC. SSC uh, plans to perform WFI processing as part of the Goddard Compute Cloud, uh, but all of the CGI data processing for which they are primarily responsible for will be performed on-premises at IPAC. DMS is also operating hybrid and will have to exchange data and information with SSC on a regular basis. So we're gonna be doing that through multiple um, cloud and internet pathways. Some of the driving requirements uh, for this system include the ability to receive, process, and store up to 13.9 terabits of compressed science telemetry per day. That, of course, expands in our system. Um, we generate level one to two science data products for both imaging and spectroscopy modes for the WFI. Uh, in astronomy, level one and two tends to refer to detector calibrated um, instrument effect remove from the data that we're processing. We also are going to generate level three and four. These are higher level science data products for both imaging mode, uh, except for some specialized survey processing that's gonna be done for imaging for one of the surveys in particular by SSC. Uh, SSC itself is also going to perform all of the higher level four spectroscopic data processing from WFI. The SOC itself and DMS uh, is charged with maintaining an online archive of all the mission data for the life of the mission and being capable of archiving about 18.2 petabytes of science data products during the normal mission operations, which is the first five years after launch. And we have to be capable of distributing 18 petabytes of data per year by the start of the mission with an expected 97 petabytes of data per year by the end of mission year five. Um, and internally, this means we need to be capable of, of transferring at least 11 petabytes of data per year. Additionally, we're charged with providing a computing environment that enables the Roman Space Telescope users to perform customized analysis of WFI data. So what this looks like at a very high level in terms of the data flow, and you can see that we have people and systems involved, um, proposers for the telescopes whose time has been granted to use the telescope use a set of tools that we provide to help design the observations that they need to take to satisfy their science. That goes through our planning and scheduling subsystem to figure out what's the most optimal way to schedule these observations on the telescope to get the science done within the time and the space that we have available. That information is transmitted to the mock who then sends commands up to the telescope to perform the observations. The data comes back down through the ground systems and DMS picks it up from Daphne Cloud and starts 
putting back the pieces of the telemetry together, associating it with engineering data that we're getting. We move into our exposure level processing to deal with that detector characterization, higher level processing that looks at combining multiple images together, removing distortions, doing um, object detection. And finally, we provide the archive services as along with the science platform for the users of the DMS system, the external astronomy community, as well as some of our ground partners who will be interacting in similar ways as the community to have access to the data and do analysis. So this is a rather intermediate view of the types of data that are flowing around the system. This is for the mission. Um, the SOC functional components are contained within this black box that you see, which includes the planning and scheduling, uh, a project reference database for configuration of mission information, and then the data management subsystem. Um, you can see there's a lot of communication, a lot of data flowing everywhere in multiple directions. Um, you can look at this later. I'm not going to go through this entire diagram. So DMS itself, uh, I mentioned it exists as a hybrid architecture of on-premises processing and storage systems and cloud processing and storage systems. Um, and I've split it, if you look at the diagram that's in the right, I've split it up into three separate partitions. These are even finer grain subsystems within the data management system that heavily interact with each other but also are co-located. So exposure level processing deals with that initial uh, detector calibration, uh, coordinating the engineering data processing and assigning it to the correct science data. It leverages a lot of the existing JWST functionality and software and systems that we already have in-house and coexists on premises at Space Telescope with our other supported missions. Um, it also supports communication with the MOC and other SOC subsystems that are located on-prem. Once that data hits level two, we push it into our uh, archive storage. We're actually are archiving level zero and one is two, but at level two, uh, the data is stored. And part of that storage process, not only catalogs it on premises so that we know what data is there, where it is, where it's going to exist, but we push then a copy of the level two data up to the cloud also for archive storage. At this point, we have processing that kicks off to do the level three and level four higher level analysis, as well as cataloging and storing of that data in the cloud itself. So this archive partition supports uh, the cloud and on-prem transfer of data. It helps manage the data storage and distribution in the cloud as well as on-premises and making that decision between on-prem versus um, the cloud uh, distribution. And it also is our interface for accepting the community contributed data products that we get back from external science teams that are analyzing the data and want to return the results back to the mission. It also provides uh, astronomical source catalogs, query tools, fairly large databases, although not as large as Ruben, um, to support the query of the information that we have in the catalog and also support query of objects um, that are there. We also have a set of uh, high level data analysis tools that you can have access to as part of that. Uh, and this is very much shares existing multi mission functionality, but that in part gives us a chance to prevent a to, to present a unified face and interface to the public that's coming in, not only for looking at Roman data, but maybe looking at Hubble or Kepler or TESS or HST data. This, the high level processing partition does exist in the cloud, uh, in part so that we can have the scalable resources to support changing science needs. Uh, it also contains the Roman science platform. Um, because we're doing this high level processing in the cloud, we want to have a place where users can access the data and do their own customized processing near the data without having to worry about the export of that data out of the cloud. So what we have here is both a combination of mission data processing pipelines that we control and we're running that are making the data and helps catalog and archive the data in the cloud, along with a copy of that high level science analysis uh, calibration software that the users can both rerun and customize in order to do, do finer grain scientific analysis. So this is just a little bit about the implementation technology. Um, on the on prem, we are reusing a lot of uh, legacy systems. Um, 
mostly running on RHEL 8. We have databases backed by Microsoft um, SQL Server, but we are also using things like SQLite, Apache, Django, MySQL. The science calibration software itself exists split both on on-prem and in the cloud. It's uh, open source. It's developed openly on GitHub. Um, the archive partition is also because it's heavily multi-mission. It's running on RHEL 7 and 8, also with uh, Windows and Microsoft SQL Server uh, database backends. Uh, but the cloud portion of the data that it manages is, is on S3 and all of the backing up of the data that we do, whether or not it exists primarily on-prem or in the cloud, is being pushed up to the Glacier Deep, Deep Archive. So for the high-level processing partition, that is in the cloud. We are using cloud-native and compatible tools and frameworks where we can. Um, mission data processing is currently controlled via the on-prem workflow manager, and we use HT Condor and Condor Annex. Uh, the science calibration software itself, it's similar to what is on-prem, also open sourced and developed openly on GitHub. And we're using Jupyter Hub, Hub with the lab interface for the science platform itself. And then we have a various, I think, pretty common set of tools that we use for testing, version control, logging. Uh, the primary languages that we do use, for, do use for all of our new development is Python. Um, but the other languages that we use primarily in the back end for support include Java, JavaScript, C, and C Sharp. So the Roman science platform itself uh, was designed with influence by the research and data science community uh, and developed within the SOX AWS application framework. We have an internal cloud application review board and we follow the Cloud Center of Excellence frameworks for that, which includes um, in-depth cybersecurity and cost control uh, reviews of all the elements that are being proposed to run in the cloud. Our goal for Roman specifically is to provide a modest amount of computation to the users with a low barrier for use. So we allocate limited computing resources fairly, um, and this is in part because we are a cost cap mission, but we don't attempt to serve the full computing needs of all Roman data users. Uh, we provide customizable data processing pipelines and access to data visualization and analysis tools through the science platform, although use of the science platform itself is not required in order to do science. So what are some of the project plain points? Um, I think one of the biggest ones is really operating within a shared ground system uh, with multiple institutions providing software and data processing. Uh, in order to meet the mission objectives, it requires a great deal of coordination and understanding of each other's operational systems the procedures that we follow, what our development schedules are, uh, and the connecting pathways that we're going to use to exchange data. Uh, since there is no one institution that's entirely uh, reducing the data from end to end, this means we have to have really good communication pathways. Uh, we did perform a, a set of trade studies early on to think about what database technologies uh, might be the best for our internal processing needs uh, within the restrictions of the mission. We did a cloud processing study uh, to determine the effectiveness of both on-prem and cloud and hybrid architectures. Uh, when we looked at science platforms, JupyterHub and Lab stood out, stood out as really a community standard. Um, and I think to a large extent, providing something that the rest of the community already has some uh, experience with, is familiar to them, also helps with the learning curve for, for picking up what may be mission-specific software as well. Um, we looked at data formatting and serialization. Uh, we primarily were looking at FITS, which is a common data format used in the astronomical community. We also have a, a data format called ASDIF. In the end, we decided that ASDIF was going to be the most effective for storing uh, the Roman data. And then we looked at um, what we might expect from the community in terms of the demand and the data transfer uh, that's going to affect DMS and how we can best serve them. So some, some thoughts on supporting open source science. All the Roman data is non-proprietary. It comes with no exclusive access limitations. All the Roman observing time is available through an open process. Um, there are key projects that are gonna be funded science investigations using the surveys. Those themselves will be openly competed. We also find that you know, easy horizontal and vertical scaling in the science platform in the cloud allows for some intensive processing of large images and complex scientific analysis workflows. 
Um, and the science calibration software, as I've mentioned before, uh, and some of the analysis tools that are associated with it are maintained as part of the open source software and they're accessible in the platform or for download. We document uh, that software in the source code repository itself. We often provide that documentation through read the docs. We also contribute back a lot of the software that we're developing for the calibration and analysis uh, of the data to the open source community and specifically the science and astronomy community. We're heavy contributors to the AstroPi project and, and other associated projects. Um, the SOC has developed um, a Roman science platform management model that we hope will make Roman data accessible and effectively allocate its computing resources. And we plan to keep the user data in the platform persistent to help support collaboration that can be done with it. Um, and again, use of the platform is not required in order to do Roman science, but we hope that people will find it useful and effective so that they will want to use it, so that they'll want to go into the cloud and look at their data and do data reduction and not necessarily expect to just egress everything out or you know, request it from on-premises to then have to run it on their own uh, systems. And finally, MAST itself does um, some things to help with open source science. We provide publishing resources, including DOIs for data and a bibliographic search for mission data. That's what I've prepared for today. Excellent. Very nicely done. Thank you, Megan. Sure. All right. So as I mentioned, our, our third speaker is, won't be available. So we are going to jump right into the Q&A session with our system architecture working group. So I'll invite Elias, Natasha, and the others to, to join in and fire away. And again, reminder, we're using Menti. So please go ahead and uh, drop questions in there and, and check it out. If, if you haven't yet. Thank you, Luke, and thank you to our speakers here. Um, one thing that really stood out is the size and the amount of data that you guys are, are processing within these systems. And that's a really good alignment, even if the data type is not similar to the ESO missions that we're looking at, the amount of data and the type of, pro the, the amount of processing uh, very much is. Uh, so first question, and we've got quite a few questions, I would say, let's try and, and and get to them uh, as quickly as we can, uh, even though we only just had two talks uh, for this uh, fishbowl. Uh, first question for you, KT. Uh, you mentioned that open source uh, is a culture, right? And it, there's a need for creating a community of practice uh, with guides and, and sort of an interactive platform around that. Uh, how much of that is actually used? I mean, maybe your system isn't yet operational, but how much do you expect that to be used? Um, so the, in terms of the, the practices that we have for um, encouraging external contributions, I think those are already in use. And, and I mean, we've seen uh, um, many, uh, many people from uh, all over the world actually uh, wanting to use our code, uh, contributing bug reports, contributing actual code uh, back. And we've still, we've been able to exercise some of the processes for taking in uh, external forked code, uh, for example. Um, and we're seeing other projects, as I said, uh, adopt the uh, components of our software uh, wholesale uh, and then feedback into that as well. So, um, uh, and then finally, of course, the. The other components that we use, uh, we're feeding back to actively. Um, not so. I, I would have liked to contribute a lot more to AstroPy than we have so far, but uh, we'll see where that goes in the future. But but also to other projects. So um, I think we are exercising all of those pro uh, processes and all of those cultural aspects. Um, and again, I think I want to emphasize that having a public. Uh, developer guide that lists those processes and and is uh, makes clear what the standards are for the code that we're we're developing. Uh, I think is a key aspect of that. Does that answer the question? Point. Uh, yes, and it's a sort of a follow-on question. That any limitations or challenges that you've seen uh, with this approach? Um, so there are some challenges. Uh, I mean, one of the the, the kind of the minor things is that our, our processes are kind of uh, development processes were designed around our uh, our issue tracking system, which is JIRA internally. Um, and the, you know, allowing other people to use that uh, has some problems. So we have this issue of having to take 
uh, reports that come from whether they're GitHub issues or uh, from um, messages and topics in our you know, community forum uh, and porting them into JIRA or, or back mm -hmm. out again. Um, so there are some issues there in terms of translation, uh, but it hasn't been a, too much of a problem yet. And I think there are some ways that we could go to to make that simpler in the future by kind of generalizing our internal development standards uh, a little bit um, if we needed to in the future. Uh, other challenges, I think, are just that um, getting the documentation to the point where new people can come in and understand what's going on in the code and the software uh, without needing somebody to hold them by the hand uh, is takes a while. Um, it's it's helped to actually have uh, boot camps uh, for some of uh, our internal staff and for our science users. Um, then and uh, we we've actually had a sort of a club uh, that incorporates uh, science users to help develop some of that documentation. Some of it's in the form of uh, tutorial notebooks that people can follow, and some of it's in the form of actual documents. Um, and so that helps to reduce the, the initial burden uh, for new people that are coming in. Uh, that, those are actually very good strategies right now. Obviously, the challenges of sharing uh, you know, things like JIRA, which may be more internal. Uh, I'm sorry, Megan, we've got just a set oh, of questions I want to get through with okay. Casey, and then we're going to spend some time with that's you okay. as well, because we've got a set of questions for you. Yeah. Uh, and just following on from this, uh, more for you, KT, in, in this, the open source and the sort of contribution and community level. Um, you mentioned that, you know, welcoming these external contributions is important. How are those uh, algorithms and, and data supported within the system? And is there a validation that happens to ensure that you know what's coming from the outside community is, is of the right quality? Um, even continuing with that, is there is there a community governance process that you're adhering to? Yes. So um, we are starting to develop a generalized uh, governance process. There's uh, for ex I mean one example that I can point to is for this. Uh, the photo Z algorithms uh, for figuring out red shifts based on uh, the measurements that we have of objects. Uh, there are many algorithms out there. Um, there are, I mean, some which are machine learning based, some which are more template based, uh, uh, statistics based. Um, and so we developed a public process for how to evaluate these, uh, for how to choose between them as to what uh, we would go forward with and uh, standardize on within the project. Um, and so that process is currently uh, running. Um, it will be completed once we have our, our first data release, uh, but then it will run again uh, for future data releases uh, to incorporate new algorithms that people come up with or, or new, um, uh, new improvements to the algorithms. So those, uh, those processes involve, uh, again, evaluation, vetting, making sure that the, uh, the algorithms can be uh, properly incorporated in to the, the data management systems, uh, that they do not require excessive amounts of compute resources or storage resources, um, and that they're producing uh, useful results. So um, all of those are, I think, uh, necessary in order to, to take in uh, community-provided uh, algorithms in this way. I see. You actually mentioned, uh, I guess, an instance of, of a specific algorithm that, that was done. That was one of our follow-up on questions was, have you actually had it in a case like that? You've already covered that one. Uh, this question came from the chat and it's also for you. Uh, what are some of the challenges you see in the open source uh, system usage? Uh, and how do you uh, address the scalability, uh, especially with advanced data processing and analytic requirements that this mission has? Yeah, so we're trying to select uh, things that we uh, either know or can make to, uh, to be scalable. Uh, part of the goal of this uh, was that um, both with, with science, uh, you can never quite be sure what scientists are going to need in the future. Um, they're, they're always coming up with new ways of, of processing data and analyzing it. Um, and uh, while our, the data, the raw data that we're com that's coming in is fixed, um, you know, the, the kinds of analyses that we want to do on it and the kinds of measurements that are being performed will change over time. And so we wanted to be make sure that, um, that the system is scalable, that we can always grow it, uh, just add hardware, essentially. Um, and of course, in the cloud, it becomes just add dollars, uh, and then you can get the hardware for that. So um, the, the, we 
basically try to uh, at every stage select components uh, that, that are scalable in this way. Um, so things like uh, Rucio we selected in particular because uh, we saw that it was uh, it had uh, front end services that were scalable by just adding more again um, more uh, nodes to, to run the same web services uh, that the that, and that they were already operating at the kinds of scales that we needed. Um, so yeah, you know, open source itself, I mean, does not uh, guarantee scalability. You have to go select for that uh, from the open source components that you're looking at. Yeah, I think yeah, it's also another running theme, right? Is to be able to make your system such that they can be easily uh, horizontally scalable. And so that seems to be a pattern you're following as well. Um, let's switch over to you, Megan. There's quite a few questions here. Uh, first one. Um, you mentioned, you know, and obviously what you've shown is sort of a multi-mission set of tools that, that already exist and that will be applied for this mission. Uh, it, it, will it be taking those software and infrastructure and deploying another instance to support this? Or is there a, a multi-mission service or software that's already running and this will be one other set of uh, algorithms within that same process? Yes. <laughs> so it changes it across it, both. It's both. It changes across our system and it depends on which part of the system you're interacting with. So a lot of our science calibration uh, software, and that's, it is an important, although not the largest part of our system, um, comes from our experience with other IR instruments like uh, near, uh, NearCam and NERIS and JWST instrumentation, along with some of the older HST instrumentation. So there's a lot of knowledge and expertise that's gone into developing some of those pieces of software. They do have to be adapted to, you know, facilitate the reduction we need for Roman, right? Detectors are never quite the same. Um, there are times where, you know, we're doing instrument testing and we need to figure out, well, is this algorithm that we've applied for the calibration purposes of this other instrument really appropriate for what we're seeing from the detector? Sometimes those things come up and we have to redesign the software a little bit. And that's, that's part of the process. Um, other parts of the system are really about infrastructure, movement of data, storing of data. Some of those, especially in our archive area, are running on shared machines, shared systems, and that's in part to facilitate multi-mission use. Um, there's a lot of the same processes that have to happen, um, and so it makes sense to do them together. I see. And, the, and do you have any challenges in terms of keeping costs and, you know, uh, for example, errors from one system to affect the other system. Uh, how do you manage that? Uh, costs are always interesting. And I think it's not just the cost of uh, what you're thinking about building your current system, but if you are using legacy systems and legacy software, there's always going to be some amount of update that has to be done in order to maintain those. Some of that gets spread across the missions. Um, the cost of storing the data, especially when we go from something like the Hubble archive. So Hubble's been up for 30 years. In those 30 years, the archive is just under 200 terabytes. Um, that's much, much smaller than what we're going to be dealing with for Roman, talking about 18 terabytes, I'm petabytes just for you know primary copy of the data. We hold multiple copies of the data as we're processing and moving it around the system. Um, reprocessing, and we tend to reprocess every six months, the Hubble archive. Um, and we expect something similar is gonna be needed for the other missions as well. So understanding what it's gonna take to store that data on-prem versus what it's gonna cost to store and serve it in the cloud is a very big part of a mission with a large amount of data like this. So that is one of the pain points that we have. I just wanna sort of uh, follow on to that. To be mindful of the time, we got a couple of minutes before we probably need to get to a break for everybody. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna assume you said two minutes, right, Luke? Yeah, let's follow on with that one. As you mentioned, the challenge of having a hybrid system, both on-prem and in the cloud, um, is do you sort of somehow are you mitigating this by having data, certain data, and processing in the cloud, and then other data and other processing on-prem? similar to what we've heard from previous missions, or, or is this somehow data has to go back and forth and you've got to egress? Uh, the, uh, what's your strategy that you're using? Yeah, the goal is to not egress data. 
right? One of the goals of providing the science platform is to encourage people to use it next to the data that we are storing in the cloud, right? So we looked at what do we think is going to be the most popular data that people will want to use and or egress. And that's one reason we have a copy of the level two data on-prem and in the cloud. We think that that detector calibrated data is going to be one of the most popular. So that allows us some flexibility in deciding whether to point people to the cloud to look at it and use it and further reduce it there, um, or to just grab it from on-prem. Now, some of the consideration has to be what is the bandwidth of those internet pathways to the people from our systems. So it, it may be, we may not be able to serve data as fast from on-prem because of that. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how the community makes those choices. If adoption of the science platform is really high, we may not, that may not be a bottleneck. Um, and we're hoping that the adoption will be there and that people will want to look at and, and analyze the data that's in the cloud, in the cloud. I see. So you've, you've sort of divided up based on the needs and their your popularity and the, needs. Uh, there is yeah. a, a greater deal of processing power that's required for some of the high level processing. And so having that in the cloud also is beneficial to the facilities that we have. And we are sharing processing and exchange of data in the cloud um, both from Goddard systems and SSC systems and, and egressing that and, and moving it around. We don't want to do too much of that. So I'm going to go one more question. Sorry, Luke, come back to KT here. Uh, there was a lot of questions we had depending, you know, the, especially on your latency and the amount of processing you need to do. Uh, so here's one specific one at the rates that you've described, you know, 20 terabytes per night. Uh, and then even larger once you start to get going. Uh, have you seen any bottlenecks or challenges uh, doing the back end on premises? And, and are these current data volumes and rates, um, do you see them migrating to the cloud at some point? Yeah, so um, in some ways it would be easier if we uh, if we did the, especially the, the large scale data, um, data reductions, well, People call them data reductions, but in our case, they're actually expanding the data. The data products take up more room than the original raw data. Uh, but the, the, the data release processing, uh, if we could do that in the cloud, uh, it would have some advantages for us. Uh, so for example, um, we're currently planning to take several months to do a reprocessing. Um, and, uh, and then there's additional time after that for, for QA, for, uh, for characterizing the release, et cetera. But, um, if we did it in the cloud, we could actually, you know, go much wider. We could use, you know, tens of thousands of nodes uh, and maybe run the whole thing in a week. Um, there are some uh, bandwidth limitations, perhaps, but uh, but in terms of pure compute, it would be easier. The difficulties are that um, there's some of it's political. Uh, we have these uh, international contributions to the project that we need to make use of, um, and so we uh, we have resources there already dedicated to to running. Uh, our release processing. Um, and some of it's also um, the particular, as, as I mentioned uh, briefly, um, the particular characteristics of cloud uh, and cloud costs right now. Um, storing petabytes of data in the cloud for many, many months is still a very expensive thing compared to uh, doing so on-prem. And uh, we, um, there are a variety of systems uh, that we're looking at uh, that will will allow us to store things uh, on prem for for fractions of, of the cost that it would cost in the cloud. Uh, so for these large amounts of data that we need to access frequently, um, on prem still makes some sense, and then sticking the compute next to them uh, makes some sense. So that's uh, that's kind of why we have things the way they are. Um, although it it might make more sense to put more stuff in the cloud. Yeah. And thank you for that, that insight. Uh, again, thank you both for, for the presentations and the Q&A session. We'll turn it back over to Luke. Great, thank you, Elias. And yeah, I just wanna also extend my thanks to both you, Megan and, and KT for your excellent presentations. I'm sure the, the team will follow up with you with some additional questions offline at another time. But that concludes our, our current session. We are gonna go into the break. Uh, I'd like to ask everyone re return at um, uh, 3.10. Eastern time. So uh, with that, we will start our break. Thank you all very much. Okay, that looks great. Are you going to have your camera on while you're doing your presentation? I think just to introduce myself and then I'm going to turn it off again. 
Okay. Yeah. Zara, I'm here now. Hi, Andy, you're going to keep me on time, right? <laughs> That's right, because you normally do that. <laughs> you have 14 minutes and 59 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> what? Where's my extra second? OK, are we ready to start this next session? <clears throat> I think we are. Did we say 12, 10, or whatever, 10 minutes past, or the hour? Well, that's not necessarily true on all areas around the world. Okay, yeah, uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, so this is a uh, session six um, of our very long agenda. Um, I hope everybody's uh, staying engaged and uh, uh, and and enjoying themselves. I know I am. Um, so in this session, it's a it's a short one. Um, we thought it would be great to hear from. Um, so we're moving away from the missions now and the actual the mission processing systems. Um, we're going to start looking at some of the uh, other aspects. So, so this session we're going to be looking at um, some of the interfaces that are um, that we would expect to, to, uh, to um, that the, the um, data systems or the mission processing systems would interface with, and you know, looking to see where they're going and uh, what are the opportunities for um, collaboration um, for the future. So we have. Uh, we have four um, speakers lined up, although the last one unfortunately couldn't make it. Uh, so we'll just be down to three today. So the first speaker is um, Sarah Lubkin. Um, Sarah is going to um, represent the Earth Science Data Information System, ESDIS, which is running all the data, the DAX. Um, and Sarah, uh, uh, that's a day job, is working there, but has also been supporting us on this um, on this study as a, as a key system engineer helping us put this whole study together. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. There I am. Hi, I'm gonna just say hi and then I'm gonna stop my video and share my screen. I'm Sarah, I'm one of the ESDIS DAC engineers, and I'm going to talk about the ESDIS project today, which does include the DACs. So here, share screen. There we go. Um, so let me just figure out my controls here since I moved my keyboard. Um, so I'm just going to start by going over our acronyms because it's easy to get all these E's and S's and D's confused. Um, so ESDS is the Earth Science Data Systems Project, which is the headquarters program office that's run by Kevin Murphy and Katie Baines that oversees the life cycle of NASA's Earth Science data with the goal of maximizing the scientific return from NASA's mission data for scientific research and applications for decision making and for the benefit of society at large. Um, the SDS funds ESDIS. The ESDIS project is located at the Goddard Space Flight Center and it manages EOSDIS, which is NASA's Earth Observing System Data and Information System. That's the system that manages all of NASA's Earth science data and it includes the DACs and the SIPs. Um, and then Earth Data is our one-stop website that provides information about the Headquarters Earth Science Data Systems Program, the ESDIS project, the EOSDIS system, and also provides access to data, getting started guides, tutorials, webinars, and so many other resources and materials for our data users and data providers. So um, like I said, the ESDIS project manages the science systems of EOSDIS, which is the focus of this talk and it oversees the processing, archiving, and distributing of NASA's Earth Science data. And that includes responsibility for the ongoing evolution of the EOSDIS system to ensure that scientists and the public have access to our data to study the planet and meet the challenges of climate and environmental change. So you can think of ESDIS as this central hub for kind of the widespread EOSDIS system that manages NASA's Earth Science data. Um, and we do the enterprise management to solve problems, which include things like security, access, interoperability, um, all kinds of things. 
Okay, so our goals are to set the bar for scientific data stewardship for all our data collections and ensure that these data meet the high standards that scientific researchers need to do their research. Our data is free to anyone, but we also want to make it easy for our users to discover, obtain, and analyze our data. And this means making sure that our systems evolve and grow and adapt as new sources of data are added and new data and new technologies are developed. It also means that we work with our user communities to enhance and improve access to the data. And we are constantly doing outreach to new communities and that we partner with other organizations, some of which have you've just heard from, um, They've been to share data and set standards that make it easier for users to integrate data from multiple uh, agencies for scientific research. Um, okay. So, like I said, EOSDIS is the system we manage, and that's the focus of this talk. It's a comprehensive distributed earth science data and information system that includes our data processing systems like the SIPs data archives, the DACs, networks, infrastructure tools, and the people that make it all possible. EOSDIS is a system that moves the data through its entire life cycle from testing to ingest to archive to being downloaded by users. And even then, EOSDIS is still providing support to our users. Um, the data includes observations collected by NASA's fleet of Earth observing satellites. Most of you have probably seen this before um, ESO is just the latest in a long history of NASA's Earth observing instruments that collect data about all aspects of the Earth system. Um, you can see ESO right here at the very end of this long line um, in orange, like the other missions that are still in pre-formulation. Um, but even at that stage, we still start working with them. Um, and then we continue to work with these missions um, as long as they're collecting data um, and even beyond that. So you can see Tara at the very beginning has been collecting data for over 20 years. Um, and in this inner kind of ring, the ISS instruments that also collect data that's archived in EOS just are shown. Um, so most, much of our data does come from satellite observations, um, but NASA has other Earth science data sets that are used with or to support satellite observations, including field data, airborne data, and new data products from NASA funded research, for example, access or measures. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so all this data provides us with information about the whole Earth system and it's used for a number of purposes. And that's important because data might be wildly different depending on what part of the Earth system was observed or what the data is intended to be used for. And so EOSS has to adapt to each type of data um, and serve its user community. So this is a lot of data. What you can see here is the growth in EOSS data archives over the last 20 years. And now with the launch of SWAT and NISAR, we expect to reach unprecedented volumes. Um, when NISAR launches next year, it will contribute over 50 petabytes of high resolution SAR data each year by itself. Um, okay. So what I have here is a cartoon that summarizes the data life cycle. This portion um, to the, it's to my left is the portion where the data is downlinked from the satellite in the mission system. Once the data is captured and clean, it becomes part of the OSDIS. It goes to the SIPs or uh, maybe another science data system for processing and then to the DACs for archive and distribution to a wide range of users. This slide is very simplified and it makes it look like a one direction process. Um, but the reality is a little bit more like this. We've seen many versions of this generalized data product life cycle over the past few days from the different science data systems that presented. Um, and how this happened will vary from SDS to, and depending on which one and which DAC. So it's a very interactive process, I think, um, that you can see where 
NASA headquarters, the science team, the SIPs and the DACs are all working together to ensure the scientific integrity of our data products. And there's a significant time you can see here spent on quality assurance at every stage. And because of this due diligence that we do, people trust our data and know they can rely on it. Um, okay, so the SIPs were created in the early 2000s to generate mission instrument science products and deliver them to the DACs for archive and distribution. SIPs are managed by mission PIs. There's 11 SIPs here on the map. We heard from a couple of these, uh, MODAPs and I think the Ocean Color Data Processing System. Earlier this week, we also heard from the ISAT2 SIPs, which is not part of EOSDIS. Um, and in some cases, algorithms don't go to the SIPs at all. They're delivered directly to the DAC and the processing is done there. For example, errors, MISER series, and some others that I've listed here. So nearly every presenter that we had um, in the first two days mentioned interactions with a DAC or a distributed active archive center. Our 12 DACs across the United States are located at NASA centers, other agency facilities and universities, and they are discipline specific centers that support different user communities. Um, so you can see GHRC right here in Alabama focuses on hazardous weather, lightning, tropical cyclones. Um, Podak focuses on physical oceanography and each DAC has its own website which serves as a gateway for their community to download data and access tools and tutorials and services and other resources. Um, what do DACs do? A quick explanation is that DACs are responsible for the archival and distribution of data but this means they work with mission teams to ensure the quality of the data, that it's appropriate for the scientific purposes it was collected for, and that it meets all NASA standards for data and metadata. The DACs also make sure that data is discoverable and provides user support to the communities. They're involved with these communities and they develop open source tools and support targeted to these users. They also um, use and contribute to the enterprise services that are common to all DACs. Um, the discipline focus of the DACs is one of their major strengths. The discipline focus comes directly from NASA headquarters. While ESDIS manages the DACs, each DAC also has a headquarters program scientist that helps guide the DACs in its interactions with the science community. Um, here's another slide about the importance of discipline science. Each DAC also has an active user working group made up of research scientists that provide feedback to the DACs. Over 20 years, these groups have contributed to um, major improvements in the NASA's services and collections. Um, so missions are usually assigned a DAC based on discipline and the ESO missions that will look at the whole Earth system are multidisciplinary. This means that the DACs will have to learn to work together in new ways to support interdisciplinary science and enable a range of scientific communities to use the data. And that's one of the things that we are working on. Um, Aside from the DACs, there's the ESDIS enterprise tools that are shared tools that are available across the DACs and also um, some of them on our Earth data websites. These are available for multiple types of data from multiple instruments that allow data discovery and use across EOSDIS. I have a list here, but for the sake of time, I'm just gonna go over a few of these. Um, the Common Metadata Repository or CMR is a backbone technology that enables a lot of our enterprise tools CMR is a high performance, high quality, continually evolving metadata system that catalogs all data and service metadata records for NASA's EOSDIS. The benefit of this is while our data is currently archived at the various DACs, it can be discovered by all our enterprise tools. Um, for example, our data collections can be accessed using Earth Data Search on our Earth Data website or at the DACs. Earth Data Search allows data discovery, filtering, visualization, and access to all our data holdings. You can search by topic, collection, place name, instrument, um, and then visualize it using Gibbs or Global Imagery Browse Service, and then you can be linked to the appropriate DAC for download. Um, the World View tool is great if you want to visually discover imagery. It provides the capacity to interactively browse through a thousand or so global full resolution satellite imagery layers and then download the underlying data. 
Um, some of the imagery layers are updated daily and are available in near real time, which means you can view current natural hazards and events using the events tab. Um, and this includes things like wildfires, storms, and volcanic eruptions. So both these tools are accessible through the Earth Data website, which has resources and information to help people get started with NASA data, regardless of their experience level. It's a all kinds of resources there. Um, two minutes, Sarah. So that's Two minutes. OK, so this is lots and lots of data. And um, wow, I thought I'd be like five minutes early. <laughs> and like I mentioned earlier, NISAR alone is going to contribute 50 petabytes of data each year. And we need to evolve to accommodate these large volumes of data. So um, traditionally, each data set's assigned to a DAC. The user goes to the DAC and downloads the data. And one of these advantage of this is that if a DAC has an issue, work doesn't have to stop. But as Willow mentioned on Monday, if a user wants data from multiple DACs, the user has to interact with each DAC separately and then download the data to be used together. And this can be time consuming and frustrating and doesn't really encourage multidisciplinary science. So we are creating a data lake, which will enable cross-disciplinary science and make it easier for users to use different types of data together again, without having to move this data to their own computer or spend lots of time tracking down different data sets. Users will be able to use data from their own discipline buckets or from all of them at once if they so want. Um, and the only limitation is their speed of access to the cloud. So we are currently in the process of moving our data to the Earth Data Cloud, which is a managed commercial cloud, um, because you just saw that's many, many petabytes of data this is a process, but our top 50 data sets will be available in the cloud by the end of the year. Um, and this will provide many benefits to our users. Most noteworthy, I think, is being able to work with large volumes of data from different DACs. Um, this is going to be a new experience for some of our users. And the DACs are working with our user communities to transition to this new way of accessing data through webinars, tutorials, and then initiatives like OpenScapes. Um, okay, and then my last slide here is just about how our users are a very important source of feedback. Uh, I mentioned our DAC user working groups earlier that provide feedback to the DAC. We also get feedback from our users through the American Customer Satisfaction Index, the ICSI survey, um, which measures our performance and our as this metric system, as well as user feedback that we get directly through Kayako on our website and um, personal interaction with users. And that's it. Hopefully, we stayed in time. Thank you, Sarah. Much appreciated. Thanks. And you will be sticking around, I assume, for, for Q&A later. Okay. Yeah, no choice. <laughs> so I'd like to next uh, introduce um, Shell, Dr. Shell Gentleman, who's um, from the Faradon Institute. Uh, Shell is a physical oceanographer uh, with a lot of experience of using the cloud um, for algorithm development and analysis. Uh, she's also a passionate advocate for open science and open source software, as well as inclusivity. So, um, uh, and I should also mention Shell is uh, one of the four steering members of this study. So, uh, um, so Shell's going to come talk to us about uh, an, another directive initiative uh, called TOPS. Can you see my screen and hear me? I can see you, can't see the screen. And I can okay. hear you. Okay. Sharing screen again. There we go, and I'll give you a two minute warning. Great. Thanks, Andy. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much. I'm here to talk to you, like, NASA, like Andy just said. NASA has a new open source science initiative called TOPS, Transform to Open Science. We have a team of about seven people already working full-time on this initiative, and we are moving fast. Uh, a lot of what Sarah just presented, and especially how she ended, is really valuable because as we're starting to make these changes in how we do science, we need to make sure that we not only bring everyone along, but we also expand participation to new people. So I'm going to quickly talk about open science. The TOPS initiative are 
big push for the 2023 NASA Year of Open Science and how you can engage with us. So why open science? And there's a lot of concerns when you talk about open science, but we think why open science is because we're facing some really big challenges. And I think what we've seen in the last couple of years with COVID and the way that sharing of data and sharing of genomes really helped us create vaccines quickly. Open science made a difference in people's lives. We're facing climate change. We need, we need everyone at the table. We need more people, more hands, more eyes, more brains with diverse experiences and backgrounds to participate so that we ask the best questions and find the best solutions. And we think open science is a really great way to do this because it accelerates the pace of science, it shares hidden knowledge and expands participation in science. It increases the impact of science and it enables new applications of data in science. So what is open science? I think that everyone I ask says that they know what open science is and then all of us have slightly different definitions. So when we say open science at NASA for the TOPS initiative, what we're thinking about is that we're creating research that is cited more, that creates a bigger impact, that increases transparency and generates more collaborations. And that inclusive science means that we're able to participate in more collaborative projects, that we're sharing access to hidden knowledge. And it leads to more equitable systems and more participation. When I talk about hidden knowledge, it's it's those things that when you're part of a privileged institution, you may not really even realize you have access to. You have access to successful proposals. You have access to data that your institution has downloaded, maybe software tools. The more that we open up knowledge and scientific knowledge and allow more people to access it, the more people can participate. And NASA's open source science is this open source approach where we're really working to activate open science. So we, we know open science is, you know, the process and results should be visible, accessible, and understandable. It's inclusive, more people can participate. It's accessible, the data, the tools, the software, the documentation, the publications, and it's reproducible. How we get there is important. How we do science is important. We want it transparent, accessible, inclusive, and reproducible from the beginning. And we want scientists to embrace this and trust in the process. And that's really what TOPS is about, is activating open science. And that's TOPS. It's a new $40 million, five-year science mission directorate initiative. It is across all of NASA science, all five divisions. And the objectives are to increase understanding and adoption of open science, accelerate scientific discoveries, and broaden participation. In 2023, NASA has declared the year of open science and then we have five years to get to our goals of having 20,000 people earn open science certification and badges, enable five major discoveries, and double participation. So what does that mean? What is the year of open science and what are we going to do? We are trying to energize and uplift open science. Visibility is a big part. I know that as a scientist, I'm pretty much really happy in whatever silo or whatever I'm doing until I see somebody else doing something really cool. And then I look over to the side and I'm like, oh, what are we doing now? So a lot of the Year of Open Science is about visibility. And we want tops and Year of Open Science everywhere with articles, announcement, Twitter spaces, conferences. And we are working with the different societies to have open science as their theme for their big annual meetings. We're already partnered with AGU, AMS, EGU. We're working on AAS, AAAS. We have conversations ongoing with a lot of these big societies, and we're working to integrate open science into their communications to scientists so that everyone will start to hear about open science everywhere they go. We're developing an online free open science curricula on Open edX, which is an open source learning management system. We're going to be teaching this curriculum at workshops, events, virtual cohorts, at science team meetings, at hackathons. So again, you can either go and do it independently, you can do it virtually in a cohort, you can do it virtually by yourself, 
or you can participate in these workshops and events and there'll be a lot of opportunities for you to meet people, expand your collaborations and do this with other people. So many paths to this open science. We're providing incentives. We're gonna have an open science badge uh, with high profile prizes and challenges that are gonna be joint NASA with the different scientific societies and high profile awards in support of open science research. So if you're doing open science, lean into that because there's a lot of prizes and awards that are gonna be uh, available and competitive for people who are participating in open science. And part of the reason we're doing that is because we want to change the game. We wanna change how science is done and make it better. So we're moving towards, and these are proposed changes we haven't Firmed this up yet, but proposals will start requiring fair, open data, open software, open access. Now, those are already required by NASA, but we want them to be earlier. We want to require an open science badge when you submit a proposal to NASA. We want funding decisions that will consider open science activities, and the awards will consider open science activities and recognize teams as well as individuals. And so this is sort of a little bit more into detail, like again, visibility and conference visibility, big open science themes, promoting the open science course, booth events, workshops, all of that. The open science course in Open Ed X, which is this high quality interactive open online course. And we wanna incentivize the completion of the course and we wanna make it easy and make it everywhere by holding it at all sorts of different workshops. What is this open science course? We've taken the five modules for the open course. It's designed for a five-day science team, so it could be taught in the morning and your whole science team would be certified by the end of the week. And it's organized as a scientific workflow. There is a fast pass where you can skip all of the modules except for the first one if you already know how to do open science. So the first is the ethos of open science. And the reason there's no fast pass for this is because it really, how you do open science how does it benefit you? Why does it benefit the greater scientific community? And also just the how. How do you do open science? When do you give people credit? When do you talk about these things? That we want everyone to participate in. Now, we're also doing open tools and resources. You know, how to use GitHub, how do you use Jupyter? Some of these popular tools that are really helpful for doing open science. How do you share software? how to effectively use and share open data, and then sharing your analysis and results. And if you do all five of those, you get the top uh, badge and certification. We're gonna be doing this with the whole community. We're having TOPS champions, where we're identifying scientists who currently do open science to act as advocates and to help teach these modules at events and at their uh, centers and institutions. We're developing a cohort, so there's a virtual cohort model similar to OpenScapes where people can learn how to do open science together. Summer schools where institutions run eight to 12 weeks of science team meetings where the modules are taught in the morning. And we fund additional people who don't normally attend NASA science team meetings to attend in order to broaden participation. And we want curriculum expansion. So we're also going to, besides this open science core, expand to discipline specific modules, other data science skills, all hosted on this free and open platform. And hackathons, of course. For part of our incentives, uh, we have societies that we're partnering to create and manage TOPS open science prizes and awards to reward significant leadership and progress towards open science and showcase the benefits. Uh, the prizes will be integrated into the awards programs and annual meetings. And we're looking both with internally and asking external partners to evaluate and update existing awards. Because we want to change the game. And here's this just an example again of how this might work where 2023, we have a lot of people try to learn how to do open science if you don't already know. And then in 24, we start bringing the community more towards open science. So first we make it so that when you submit your proposal, there's a button to check about your open science badge. The next time one member is required, the next year 50% is required. And by the end of this, we want all the people participating in NASA scientists or the majority of them to be participating actively in open science. 
And we're doing this because we want to expand pathways. We're weaving DEIA and environmental justice principles through all of our activities. And we're hosting targeted environmental justice science events, investing in summer schools, and co-developing opportunities with MSI and HBCUs. So how can you get involved? To implement a cultural shift, we need community engagement from a broad spectrum across the scientific community, not just scientists, but also managers, institutions, agencies that would be willing to help host and fund prizes and challenges, work on co-development of this open science curricula, and uh, develop open science action plans for your institutions, for your organizations, and if you can, budget for youth activities. NASA is funding the TOPS activity, but in order to do this, to change everything, we need everyone. And so that means we want everyone to participate. And we look forward to collaborating with you. We are on GitHub. There's a QR code that you can scan. There's an email address, that uh, an email list that you can sign up for. And we'll be announcing a series of community meetings starting next month. And there's the GitHub with discussions enabled for further questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Joan. Right on time. Well I've done, done this before, you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, exciting times, though. Thank you. OK, so now we're going to switch gears slightly, and we're going to um, head over to Ames, um, to NASA Ames. Uh, John. Uh, Jenkins, um, who is a research scientist and project manager at the um, Advanced Supercomputing Division at Ames. Um, he conducts research on data processing and, uh, and is also involved heavily in uh, science data pipeline productions and development, uh, principally working with the Kepler mission and for the NASA's test missions. Um, so we asked John to come and talk about uh, HPC types activities uh, and so forth. Um, and I believe John will be also um, working along uh, maybe part of this presentation with Bob Quixote, um, who is the chief technologist um, up at Ames as well. So uh, um, John, I'll let you introduce uh, Bob for us. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andy. Yes, I have Bob Ciotti alongside me. He's the Chief Technology Officer for NASA's Advanced Supercomputing Division. And at this point in time, I will start my presentation. So I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about NASA's high-end computing capability and our growing support for science data processing for Earth System Observatory missions. As an overview, NASA's High-end computing capability at Ames is NASA's only cloud-scale private HPC cloud infrastructure. We have similar economies of scale to CSPs who run multiple hyperscale data centers. Uh, we've got a rather robust infrastructure. Uh, we can build it out uh, easily to supply over 1 billion standard billing units uh, each year, and we have enough land to double that again by expanding. Uh, we have roughly 120,000 CPU and GPU cores, uh, lots of compute, 100 petabytes of online data storage, over 350 petabytes of offline data tape storage, and we can increase that up to one exabyte. Uh, we have supplementary analysis systems that are available for clients, and we offer scientific consulting for optimization and help. Uh, and this can often uh, result in significant code speed ups for folks. And we offer data analysis and visualization as a service. Now, the traditional focus at the NAS has been on modeling and simulation, but uh, we've, we're evolving to support hybrid computing and improvements around latency as we move into this age where we have much larger uh, growth in earth science data sets, especially. So here's the historic and projected capability growth in terms of uh, the utilization of our compute, the compute capacity, the disk storage and the tape storage. So we've had enormous growth over the last 10 years and we project that to continue for the, for the foreseeable future. Meeting tomorrow's computational challenges will require that we change. Uh, we want to um, build out hybrid computational capabilities between HECC and cloud systems. We want to tailor our file systems to large observational data sets. Uh, uh, these typically have many small files rather than data streams from simulations, more random file IO. And that's motivated us to increase our solid state storage at uh, seven petabytes of solid state disk drives. 
uh, we're factoring the compute node needs of these observational data sets and the processing they require into hardware selection. We do have a variety of systems available to optimize the compute for different use cases, different balances of the amount of memory versus the number of cores. And we can also offer uh, node scheduling to support different use cases. Uh, so normally users um, would have to get in a queue, but you can actually reserve nodes and say, I want 100 nodes at 10 a.m. on Tuesday to run my uh, processing. Uh, we can also allow you to uh, procure dedicated resources, whether it's compute or storage, and we can also set up special queues for high priority work. Uh, we want to make our system more high availability uh, through the use of fault tolerant networks for, uh, to peer providers and using UPSs for critical infrastructure, which will also help improve support for low latency applications. Uh, we respond to SMD requirements. Indeed, 50% of our funding comes from the SMD. Here's a list of the earth science projects that are currently running on HECC. I wanna spend a, a few minutes talking about cost terminology. So a standard billing unit is the work that can be completed in one hour on a dual socket Broadwell node. This kind of highlights the need for standardized um, benchmarks for use in comparing uh, the capabilities of different uh, facilities. Um, and how we uh, construct that cost is basically take 75% of our capacity for compute and divide it by our annual budget that gets us to about 50 cents for fiscal year 21. Now we actually typically deliver more than 75% of our capacity in each given year, typically 85%. So it's actually somewhat cheaper, 42 cents for fiscal year 21. And if you procure uh, compute, dedicated compute systems nodes, then you're actually purchasing the SBUs on the margin. And so uh, if you have those systems for three years, that's 20 cents per SBU and nine cents per SBU at seven years. And so um, if you look at the graph on the bottom right, uh, you'll see that we've expanded our uh, delivery of standard billing units by a factor of 10 over the last 10 years. And at the same time, the cost of the compute has dropped by a factor of 10. Now, normally um, services that we provide are, uh, are totally free to the consumer because they're given an allocation from SMD to do their work. And so the cost is totally transparent at the user level, but it is an agency cost. And the cost is all inclusive, facilities, personnel, everything that we offer. Um, I do wanna talk about planned enhancements. Uh, we want to improve support for containers. Um, we wanna support uh, high SDS digging and other hybrid processing systems that need to span HECC and cloud resources. We need to look at how to improve our networking and, and handle egress fees, uh, improve connections to internet two and AWS. And we want to modernize and modularize our facility to reduce or eliminate the need for full facility maintenance that brings us down for one week each year. And of course, we have security patching at other times that um, presents issues for uh, connectivity and availability. Uh, the goal is to do rolling updates um, so that you don't take the whole system down. That way, any interruption is, is much briefer than it normally would be at this time. Uh, we do have a capability to re-export data sets from inside HECC to make those available to the public. And uh, I'll give some examples of that in a little while. We're interested in developing hybrid computing and storage architectures to meet the agency's needs. This is to optimize resource allocation as well as time to solution for all the different computing tasks that, that are done as part of these projects. We wanna leverage the unique features and advantages of the public cloud platforms that complement on-prem private cloud high-performance computing and storage that we can offer. Uh, the cloud is known for their uh, large, huge data um, capacity and availability, resilient control infrastructure, all the services that they provide and community engagement. It's certainly the place where you're gonna have, have open science done by the most people. On the other hand, HPC offers large scale, lower cost for sustained computing capabilities. And um, those can be very powerful when we synergize and work together. Uh, we have several pilot projects. Uh, we're collaborating on, on running high SDS for processing NISAR data. Uh, we're running the multi-mission algorithm analysis platform at HECC. And we uh, have a new project where we're doing urgent computing for streaming satellite data analysis in a wildfire analysis context. So this is uh, an architectural diagram showing that um, we need to have connections between the private cloud and the public clouds. And it may be indeed advantageous to have a content delivery cloud uh, where you have a low cost um, cloud storage facility, perhaps something, something like Wasabi that can offer very low 
cost for the storage and allow us to help move some of the data around. And it can also be a place where you can have additional community engagement and open science for those uh, folks who can't afford the compute on the public clouds for the science they want to do. So here's a specific example in the context of wildfire monitoring and modeling. Uh, we'll stream the satellite data into the cloud. You'll have regional and global model outputs and where you'll apply the machine learning to map and track fires, aerosols, and plumes. And of course, that's where the data become available to the community. Um, but you can do the heavy lifting on the mo modeling and on the uh, training the machine learning uh, and doing the visualization of the model and the observations on the hardware that's in HPC, and then provide that information back to the cloud and to the community. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about <clears throat> science pipelines at the NAS. Uh, personally, I've been involved in building several of these. The two foremost are for the Kepler mission and uh, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite. So the Kepler mission launched in 2009. Its goal was to determine the frequency and distribution of Earth-sized planets uh, orbiting sun-like stars. And to date, we've discovered over 3,000 of the 5,000 known exoplanets to date. And the inset you see um, uh, the current uh, set of exoplanets that we know about plotted in this parametric space of planet radius versus orbital period. And I've used a mass radius relationship to be able to plot the radial velocity discoveries. Um, the red points here are the discoveries from Kepler and you see the black points, those are from TESS, the much newer mission. We have ground-based transit surveys in green and radio velocity and imaging and microlensing survey results as well. The uh, data rate was quite modest from Kepler, one gigabyte a, a day, but um, we started out processing on our own private cluster. And after two years, we needed to reprocess and it took 10 months to do that. So that was clearly not sustainable. So in 2011, we ported our code over to the supercomputers, the Pleiades at Ames, and started processing there. And that was actually a key enabling technology to achieve mission success. Based on the success of Kepler, which taught us that every star has on average at least one planet, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey satellite launched in 2018 to do a near all sky survey to look for planets around stars typically 10 times closer and 100 times brighter than those observed by Kepler. That meant that we can follow up and characterize many of these planets in much greater detail than we could with the Kepler discoveries. And so to date, we've discovered uh, 199 planets, probably 200 <laughs> as of today, uh, since yesterday. And we've got um, 72 planets for which we've measured the masses, which are smaller than four Earth radii. On the inset plot, we have planet radius versus planet mass. And most of the planets, uh, these uh, colored disks that reflect the equilibrium temperature on the color scale, uh, lie clustered on the Earth-like composition line here. Um, but above 1.5 Earth radii, they tend to peel off and have uh, larger extended envelopes, either water vapor or hydrogen and helium. Uh, and so we're starting to really learn about what planets are made of. And the next step, obviously, is to follow up many of these discoveries with the James Webb Space Telescope later this year. The data rates have increased considerably. So today we're bringing down 26 times more data per day than we did with Kepler, but we're processing it much, much faster based on the Kepler uh, experience, we would have predicted that it would take us 23 days to process a month of test data. It takes us five days to process that much data. I'm sure we could do uh, better than that if we put time into it. Uh, the other thing I'd like to note is that TESS is the most popular and most downloaded data set at the Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes to date. So very, very productive mission. Uh, well, um, how do we do all this? Well, here's the Kepler Science Operations Center architecture. We work hand in hand with the Data Management Center at Space Telescope, as we do for TESS as well. Um, and Ziggy's predecessor was the pipeline infrastructure module uh, for this pipeline. And we basically stripped it out um, and made its own standalone software project. We learned a lot when we ported all of this pipeline to the test context. We took that opportunity to try to make the pipeline infrastructure module agnostic as to what kind of science data it was processing. So Ziggy is capable of running complex science algorithms on large data sets. You can run it on a laptop, a workstation, or on the NAS Pleiades supercomputer. And recently we've demonstrated that we can run Ziggy in AWS. So it is a flexible, scalable pipeline controller, uh, automated dispatching to Pleiades for large uh, data sets and large tasks. It provides excellent data accountability, uh, uh, providing permanent storage for all the version changes, all the linkages between parameter values and pipeline tasks. 
so that we can reproduce any given data set any given time. It has excellent logging and diagnostics for those occasions when something does go wrong. And uh, it's currently being released under the NASA Open Software Initiative. It's a technical readiness level of seven and is classified as class C under NPR 7150. I recently, uh, in the last two years, we've been applying Ziggy to a uh, Pathfinder pipeline study for the surface biology and geology uh, mission. And uh, we've stood up this pipeline to process Hyperion data, which was a hyperspectral imaging data set acquired over 18 years by the Earth Observer 1 um, satellite. And we've completed processing the 55 terabyte uh, Hyperion data set to top of the atmosphere radiances. You can see on the right, there's um, a uh, false color composite image pair over the Bay Area, and four different locations were chosen, and you can see the top of the atmosphere radiances in the graphs uh, just to the right of the images. And then we've also um, been running ISOFIT, uh, an open source uh, code from JPL, and ATRAM to do the atmosphere correction to derive the surface reflectances. And you can see we're comparing those against each other. Uh, currently, we're checking the consistency of the Hyperion surface reflectance results with RadCalNet and for scenes that we have that data, and with Avaris scene pairs that are co-located with Hyperion. Uh, we hope to complete that work and get all this data up on the data portal shortly. Two minutes Future work will, thank you. So we'll be incorporating uh, level three algorithms for vegetative traits and or aquatic studies in the very near future. And then on, on the bottom, what we have is that we have uh, the uh, Ames Global Hyperspectral Synthetic Data Set. This is an effort by other personnel at Ames, uh, Waila Wang, um, who's created a synthetic full year set of proxy uh, SBG data using MODIS data in Avaris Hyperspectral Library. Uh, we've got the first year of this data up on the data portal. You can see the URL down below. And then these are two animations of that data set. Okay, um, we, we uh, chose an exercise for Bob and I to do, and that was to scale up the data rate for uh, Hyperion to the SBG data rate. Uh, so we're talking about 55 terabytes being about five days of data for SBG. It takes about 9,000 SBUs for us to process the Hyperion data to uh, level two. And so that means we need about 600,000 SBUs per year for a scaled up version of Hyperion that would match the data rate for SBG. So in this model, we uh, purchased 256 nodes up front. We plan to run it for seven years. That would allow us to reprocess at triple the speed of, um, of the forward processing. We need to purchase four petabytes of tape each year to keep the L0 data on hand. And uh, the plan would be to reprocess every two years. So the bottom line is that we can easily do this. Uh, for about $7 million. Uh, uh, this would be a cost to the project uh, to have that dedicated, those dedicated resources for this work. There are a lot of caveats for this. Um, I'll let Bob and myself handle those through question and answer periods or uh, via uh, uh, email or whatever. Um, so I wanna go on and finish with my conclusions. This is a huge opportunity for HECC to assist ESO data processing needs. Um, uh, most likely the impact would be in offloading heavy lift processing requirements to HCC when that makes sense. And uh, we need collaborative benchmarking to understand the potential impact of HECC and other uh, compute providers to ESO uh, MDPS. Uh, you can uh, co-locate dedicated mission support systems uh, within, a, you know, within the Pleiades supercomputer at Ames under a memorandum of understanding. Um, we need to improve our network connectivity and peering to remote systems such as AWS and NCCS. And ideally processing pipelines would transparently be able to span the cloud and HEC, levering the high availability of the cloud systems and the lower compute costs in HECC. We do have the opportunity to publish data through HCC via the data portal or the cloud. And we have a lot of data already out there. Uh, compression techniques may prove to be very valuable for continuing the exponential data growth. Um, and uh, the final note is that uh, we're open sourcing Ziggy, a flexible, scalable science pipeline control infrastructure. And, I, and the last point, early engagement and planning with HECC is essential to maximizing the impact. Uh, it takes six to 12 months or so to make sure you have a lead time to get dedicated uh, uh, systems uh, identified and procured and in place. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, thanks. Thanks, John. Fantastic. It's great to hear what's going on. So appreciate that. Um, 
So our next speaker was supposed to be Ingo Simonis from the uh, OGC, who was going to talk about data system standards, but unfortunately he couldn't make it today. So, uh, but I believe he will be uh, engaging with the working group at some time in the future. Um, so that allows us now to move straight into the uh, fishbowl discussion um, with the working group. And then after that, we'll take a break. Over to you, Natasha. Thanks, Andy. Um, really quickly, can you give us a check then how long we have? Because we have a, a lot of questions. Um, so let's give you, I think we have planned to give you 15 minutes. So let's stick with the 15. Okay. Um, so let's start with, um, so this first question is for Sarah. How does EOS Sys decide when and how tools will become shared? Do the different discipline DACs contribute updates in a collaborative way? If so, how does EOS DIS create a community of practice for enabling those contributions? Um, and this is kind of stemming from this idea that open science is a community and a culture, and you kind of got a, a, an example of how the DACs are all doing that. Yeah. Um, gosh, there's so much in that question. Um, we, yeah, it's a collaborative culture, for sure, the DAX. Um, we have many opportunities for collaborating. And um, Andy? Sure. I'm um. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, which one do we want to jump into first? So yeah. we do have, uh, as uh, Sarah was saying, a collaborative culture. We have a, uh, we've been mandating now any of the software or applications that come out must go through the NASA open source process. Uh, we do have issues with how long that takes, but um, we do promote that um, our things are tools are shared. So we do have two levels of tools. We have our enterprise tools that Sarah was mentioning, sort of like the common metadata repository, um, which is enterprise across EOS DIS. All the DACs are uh, a part of that. That has now been picked up outside of EOS DIS. So it's open source. Noah's picking it up. Um, there's other implementations uh, we heard earlier uh, from uh, Anka and Klaus on their use of um, CMR inside of MAP, and Doug just wrote that actually in there. Um, so I'm trying to think of, there's a lot of questions in there. So some of the other ones, uh, we actually are putting a, we, the larger ESDS program, uh, Earth Science Data Systems program, is putting together a document um, to uh, work on how to better have a collaborative community engagement um, while we do this open source work. Um, I don't know if Shell had mentioned that or not. We have done that on the, uh, as this side early on, one of our uh, tools, Cumulus, was one of our, our big community developed models. So we have a process in this agile software development model where we actually bring all the DACs in, we bring, uh, representations from the SIPs and we have a communal development model. So everyone is participating along with our, our contractors um, on the development. So it's a badgeless team. Um, so we started that. So we have these huge quarterly meetings, uh, which we call program increment, program in, increment planning um, every quarter of the year, which everyone comes in and they go off in their, their rooms and they help with this. Which question did I miss? There's a lot in there. <laughs> no, I think you got that. I think I think it's exactly, you know, I'm just thinking in this space where you have multiple missions and you may have some shared resources and you have a model for how you've been doing that. So I think you answered our question there. Okay. Um, this next question is for John. Um, with NASA DAX settling in on Data Lake in AWS Oregon region, are there any plans to help with utilization of HEC while addressing potential egress costs of NASA data in the DAX? Um, and what, what about the constructs of co-locating processing next to the data? 
So I think there's a lot there, but what do you do when, when the data is in AWS and heck, and what are you doing to cost optimize there? Right. So uh, one of the patterns that we're using with high SDS is to identify when it's advantageous to reverse burst, to burst data from AWS into HECC. And uh, we're working with with Hukwa on that and Bob Ciotti um, actually could speak a lot more about that. So we are very concerned about data egress costs, but it seems like we need to work towards a way where it may make uh, the most sense to have a lot of the lower level processing happen on, on prem as is being done and planned for on Roman Grace, uh, Roman Space Telescope. Uh, there are other opportunities, however, and so I think uh, We'll have to see how this evolves, but um, it's something that we're going to have to deal with and looking to uh, other cloud providers, perhaps, who can provide very low cost um, storage may be part of the answer. Great, thank you. Um, moving on to think about this interface between the data system and the DAC. Uh, so this first question is uh, for Sarah, and let me just, I, want, I have multiple, so I have to pick the best one. Um, no one else back here. Mm -hmm. um, the NASA cloud-based data lake service may provide many opportunities for users to create new value added derivative products. Any thoughts on if public users will be able to more easily add metadata pointers to the derivative products into CMR? or any other mechanisms for how like sort of user contributions of data products may get integrated. You're on mute, Sarah. Ah, having trouble unmuting myself. Um, oh, well, that's a good question because it's something that um, we're thinking, of. how do we, become open, but still maintain security and are um, keep our quality as it is. And, you know, the metadata is an important part of how we do things. So some things may not be um, something that people can contribute to um, in order to keep services as they are. But these are things that we're thinking about. Um, it's definitely a different way of doing things. Okay, is yeah. that Andy, something? Andy. Sorry, go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I was to elaborate on what Sarah said. It's exactly right. It's not something that we currently have as a requirement, but one of the things that we've seen is by making some of these tools like CMR open source, someone can have a uh, their own mini. Um, copy of their metadata holdings that they need access to where they can expand on our metadata model for particular things that are germane to them. And this is for, a, I've seen an external person who's not a data provider of ours, that they're not a DAC, they're not a SIPS, this is someone else who has their own one-off project. Uh, there's nothing stopping them from taking a copy of CMR and doing something on their own project on their own. Okay, great. Um, I recognizing the time, I want to make sure we get to this. Um, so this is about open science and tech development. So Shell, if you could come off, um, put, turn on your camera. Um, so you talk about generating a badge for open science, but the definition of open science that you gave is actually quite vague. And it's hard to derive what your exact criteria are for determining that something is open science. Thinking about the role of cyber infrastructure of an MDPS with community contributions, what should we be tracking to enable objective evaluation of open science for creating that badge? Oh no, I really hope Shell was here because I think that's a good question. <laughs> okay, we'll have to follow up with her after. Um, I will jump, ah, multiple of these questions are for her. John, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, so we've seen some MDPSs that partly use your system for overflow processing, but none that solely use it for their entire MDPS. And we haven't seen any that plan to. Is your strategy to gear the system more towards supporting MDPSs or will HEC continue to be really geared towards modeling and simulation workflows? 
if more support for MVPS is, what is your plan and what missions are you working with? Right, so we do have plans to support more missions. Uh, you know, as I showed earlier, unless I misunderstand the question, we have done all the, all the processing in our pipelines for Kepler and TESS that was almost cradle to grave. But we're interested in, you know, building out our, our capability and supporting uh, MDPS. Currently, we're involved in this uh, Pathfinder pipeline study for SBG, where we're specifically tasked to investigate HPC architectures, but also to uh, develop hybrid HECC um, cloud architectures as well. Okay, great. Um, and to better conduct our trade studies, is there a way to better assess the total cost of ownership with HEC so we can compare apples to apples um, with the cost we pay to a cloud vendor? So let me give you a little context for this. This came up in the open science uh, group breakout yesterday where they were saying, you know, look, for me as a PI, it's free to use HEC, even though it comes at a cost to NASA for egress for example. So the PI is not incentivized to go to the cloud where, to work with the big data because it's free for them no matter what, whereas it costs something to NASA for egress to come to HEC. And so um, that's the basis of this question, if that makes sense. Right. Well, I, I think those are some of the thorny issues that we need to deal with and uh, to try to see if we can take advantage of the capabilities that complement each other between HECC and, and the cloud providers. Um, we do allow users the ability to go to AWS through HECC, and so this is, uh, in some sense, early days, but um, I'm very excited to see what happens as this evolves over the next several years. Um, but yes, those are, those are really good questions to have, and uh, as uh, the Nancy Grace Rowan Space Telescope has done, there are key advantages to processing on-prem, at least for the first um, uh, several levels of data processing. Great, and I think one of the suggestions that came up from the open science breakout yesterday was um, having kind of like a cost calculator or cost estimator. Um, and so is that something that would be sort of an ongoing conversation with HECC and let's say whatever this architecture were to be, you know, how do you appropriate let somebody know where they should be going to do their analysis because it's overall cheaper for NASA. Right. So I, I think that with respect to costs, um, the fact is the HECC costs are open and available to the public. So we can tell you exactly what our costs are. And that's um, not the problem in and of itself, um, but the cost models for the cloud providers are very complex. And I think it's very difficult to understand what the, what the true cost in the cloud is at this point in time. Um, so we're, we're happy to provide our costs and to work with folks to better understand what the costs are, um, not just to the agency, but also to projects that need dedicated resources as ours did for Kepler and TESS and as many folks uh, on these larger missions would need dedicated compute, dedicated storage. And that, that includes coming the hidden costs, you know, the staffing, the egress, all the stuff that you kind of put behind it. All, all that certainly needs to be considered and brought into it, yes. Great, uh, let's see, we've got two minutes. Um, let me just ask this question to Sarah really quickly. Um, to what extent do you see DAX taking on more analysis processing needs of the community since it's, and this could be Sarah or Andy, um, for the community since it's co-located with the archive? Andy, you want to take this one? Uh, let me think about that. <laughs> um, so I, I hate to keep running this in the line. We are looking at cloud, but right now our, our, our prime focus is on the archive side. We are looking at what it would take to work with some of these archives, uh, or not archives, these other processing centers to make sure that our data lake is easily accessible by the HPCC. HPC, the other uh, science clouds uh, within NASA to make sure there's a, a good connection there. I don't see the DEX taking a role on being the prime um, uh, 
prime compute and analysis platform for the um, external end users. Not to say that that we won't may not have a role with some of our, our science teams. I think that I can see a future for that as we get into the science data processing systems and our, our science investigator led processing systems. But for the general purpose community, um, I think that responsibility will lie on uh, some of the architectures like MAP and some of the other ones that we've heard throughout the workshop where they're taking core components of what we've developed and they're building a system for the, um, their own needs. As uh, John was saying, there's a, a huge cost portion of that and uh, <laughs> we will not be picking up the cost of uh, that for the general public. Yeah, nothing like putting you on the spot here, huh? Um, no problem. <laughs> okay, well, that got us exactly to 215. So actually, Shell is online. So if you wanted to take a couple more uh, minutes to ask Shell her, her questions. Okay, and Andy Bingham, I think I heard you. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say this. Okay. Same. Okay, right, great. I'm, I'm co chairing an OSM session at the same time. <laughs> okay, well, if only we could clone you. Um, okay, so this question. Um, you talk about generating a badge for open science, but the definition of open science that you provided is actually quite vague and hard to derive what your exact criteria are for determining that something is in fact open science. Thinking about the role of cyber infrastructure of an MDPS with community contributions, what should we be tracking to enable ob objective evaluation of open science for creating that badge? So this is kind of thinking about a crediting system. Yeah, so I'm gonna break this question apart. Uh, the first part is actually quite easy and quick to answer, which is the TOPS Open Science Badge will be awarded upon completion of all five of the Open Science core curriculum modules. You have to do the first one, the other four there's fast pass for, or you can complete those. Upon completion of those five modules, because we're using a learning management system, we'll be able to give you a badge that has API backend. So it goes through your, or your ORCID, maybe GitHub, it goes everywhere. So then you have your badge. Now, how people do open science and how you measure open science activities, I have not found a really strong community consensus on. And that's part of TOPS as a project is to actually go to the community. We will be forming a working group to actually define this. We have lots of ideas for how to do metrics, but we know there's lots of people in the community. Open science is not new. We are not reinventing the wheel. We are working with existing community to develop these metrics so that we can move forward together with some community consensus. Okay, great. Um... I wish we had the answer to that now. Can we just I like, do can we fast forward? Because that would really help us figure yeah. out. We can call it the O is. index. We know that. And uh it's gonna okay. and it's gonna, yeah. It's it's <laughs> you know, the, the difficult part is there's so many different ways to do open science and participate in science. And we want to make sure that any index we develop is either very clear and specific about what it is and what it is not measuring. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think just to the SOG, there's a good comment in the chat here that we should make sure we capture. Um, so uh, for, this is around cybersecurity. There seems to be some disconnect between the goals of open science and the current cybersecurity policy, policies that restrict many things needed by open science methodologies. Are there any suggestions or plans in place to help the projects balance the cybersecurity policies with progress towards open science? I would, I guess I need a little bit more clarification on specifically what cyber infrastructure policies are preventing open science. Is this like permissions on GitHub? Or, you know, there's, there's very commercial companies that are really highly secure that are participating in open science. You just have to be really clear about who has what permissions. So we heard this actually from Nayara in the open science panel on day one, where she was saying, yeah, like even just working with people or getting them to work with the data or provide any contributions earlier, they have to get onboarded into JPL yes. so that I can buy, and then I have to buy them a computer and then there has to be VPN. Yeah. And so thinking about an MDPS, whether it's one or multiple for each mission, 
people providing community contributions in a more open way, i.e. not through some science team only selected process, you know, there's going to be some cybersecurity issues. And are there any plans through TOPS to investigate those, revisit them? Um, You know, what's happening there on that front? This actually, these topics fall into the NASA, Steve Crawford's area. This is within, so within the NASA Open Source Science Initiative, the cyber infrastructure part of that is put within OSSI and then TOPS is really the community development. We get all of the happy topics to deal with. Uh, but, but what I do know is that, yeah, there are part of the cybersecurity um, restrictions on working with people are when people are working on these fairly secure, you know, NASA clouds, or I've seen the same thing in NOAA uh, and other federal agencies. And part of what we need to figure out, and there, I don't believe there is an answer yet, is how are we going to set up these cloud projects for different missions so that they allow for externals to um, participate? And I think that that's part of what this whole workshop is trying to explore and find out what the community thinks might be a solution that works for them. And once those user needs are identified to then have the agencies actually develop requirements around those needs rather than the, having the agency tell everybody what is going to be the solution. Great, I think that's a perfect time to stop. <laughs> yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, great set of discussions and presentations. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so we're going to take a 10 minute break. Um, and when we return, we will um, have a, uh, we're not doing the breakout rooms, we will be doing a, uh, uh, a, a group discussion amongst everybody's here. Um, and uh, Natasha and Elias will be running that. So uh, see you in 10. And we are back. Welcome, everyone. Um, hope everyone can hear me. My screen is frozen. We can hear you, Andy. Perfect. <laughs> um, so now, um, as we announced earlier, this is going to be our sort of our, our plenary session for Q&A um, that Natasha is going to run. So we have some questions, and I, I see they have been filling up. Um, so I'll hand it over to Natasha to run it over. I think we have 30 minutes for this. Yeah, thanks. I think that that sounds right. I'll try to get us out exactly at three mountain, which I think is right at the end. Um, so the way that this works is, there we go. The way that this works is you can go to menti.com. You can do it on your phone. You can do it on your web browser and you can type in this code. And then you can type whatever you want. Um, there's a lot of us on this call. I believe there's 66 people. So um, this is a way for you to share your ideas um, openly um, and general impressions that you really want, um, especially the SAWG to hear about different architecture variants. And as we see them sort of populate onto the screen, um, then we can kind of call out specific things and see if we can have a little more of a freeform discussion. Um, if we identify something that maybe needs a little extra attention and a deeper dive in conversation, we um, just type in the chat like, hey, I really want to talk about this and it might dominate. Um, so we can set up a breakout room and people can go off. The only thing we ask is that if you do do a breakout, you take notes. Uh, so that you can at least share them with the SAWG, um, or maybe we can at least put an SAWG member in that breakout room with you. So go ahead and type some stuff in uh, here. Um, what have you been your general impressions about developing an MDPS architecture um, and what we need to think about as we consider different variations um, in support of, and remember these are our four objectives, um, in support of the next generation of ESO missions, data system efficiencies, earth science applications, and open science. So remember, an architecture can be everything from deployment to implementation to the component technologies that we use along the way, 
um, shared services, things like that. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a lot of hybrid systems. Um, are there any thoughts about how they've gone hybrid? Um, to me, a lot of them say, oh, you have the option to deploy it on-prem or on, a, on the cloud. And I actually had an interesting conversation the other day with someone who's like, what is the real difference between on-prem and on the cloud? And I was like, well, functionally, they're both supercomputer clusters. One is just behind an organization firewall and the other is potentially available to the public. So technically, if something's interoperable and deployable on some kind of supercomputer, it should be able to deploy between those two. I personally haven't heard a whole lot about how to cost or how to optimize between those two. I'm, I'm interested to see if others have any thoughts or general impressions where they, they saw a group that was maybe doing it really well or forward thinking and how to go between those two seamlessly without just simply deploying containerized workflows from one to the other in batch processing. You know, if you just have to look at me the whole time, you're gonna get really bored. Um, I'd love it if somebody would respond um, either through like written or if you want to come off, uh, put your camera on or jump in and have a reaction to something I'm saying. Some of what I'm saying is intended to be inflammatory to get a reaction um, and a response. Can I say something inflammatory and get a reaction? Please do. This is Peter Tenenbaum, and I'm going to say the opposite of this. I'm surprised to see how many people are so excited to go to a more expensive, more complicated system with poorer available support like a cloud when NASA's got its this awesome high, high performance computing facility. I think we should all just be using that and forget about AWS and Google and Microsoft. Okay, and I think that seems to go in line here with this, uh comment, uh, John's slides show a 20 to one cost advantage over the cloud. Um, so why would you do one or the other? I think both are needed. Um, I think I think whoever wrote this agrees with with what you've said. Um, let me let me say one more thing. I mean, when I when I bring this up, there are various things that are that are talked about, like, well, you know, the access at the NAS, you have to go through all these hoops to get access, or, you know, there's security policy, or not everyone can get it in there. And the question is, I guess, is it real? Are these really sufficiently compelling reasons to go to the cloud? Or are they compelling reasons to make HPC able to have the advantages of commercial cloud that are driving people over there? So PT, I think um, one thing I'd say here um, that it's there are certain things that you want to do in terms of distribution and access that HPC will never be able to do, right? It's this, you know, openness, right, where anybody can get access to the data and to do computation or download it, and so we're never going to be uh, in a position to um do a better job than what you can do in the cloud so the the what you want to figure out is you know how do you you know do that piece which is your absolute um you know it's really a mandatory thing we want to collaborate with the world on these things and make these data available that's a mission objective that's the mission of smd and but we also want to you know, do a lot of this heavy lift computing, right? And so HPC is, you know, this heavy lift piece. And, you know, the problem is, is that the cloud uh, vendors, you know, want to try to 
compel you to use their thing. And so the cloud as it exists today may not be what NASA really needs, right? But what NASA needs is this thing that meets their objectives um, in a sensible way um, and that we can afford. And so that's, you know, how do we structure our procurements and our uh, strategy so that we, you know, communicate the needs? Because we're the customer of the cloud. NASA is paying for this thing. And, And so, uh, we should have some control over what that thing looks like. So let me uh, hold, well, hold on. I want to I want to give KT a moment because he's raised his hand um, to respond. Sorry, this is just a protocol that we use, but um, uh, yeah, I think there are, there are three major reasons why uh, Ruben wants to use the cloud, the public cloud. Um, I mean, we are using cloud deployment technologies everywhere. Um, It's just the way to do, uh, you know, lower human cost uh, deployments and operations of systems. But um, the public cloud for, one is for the the access reasons that people have talked about. Um, Just getting accounts at a lab or or other computer center uh, can be difficult, uh, whereas maintaining uh, accounts in the cloud is a lot easier. Um, a second one is so that uh, you can get access to near infinite, it seems, amounts of computing capability uh, and particularly uh, new technologies as well. Um, I mean, we know, all know what the supply chain issues are now and how long it takes to actually get new drives, new, new cores, uh, CPUs in. Um, whereas in the cloud, you can go, you kind of can burst to thousands and thousands of nodes um, near instantly. And, uh, and they can use GPUs if necessary, for example. Uh, and the third thing is the idea of uh, bring your own resources. That um, when users have grants or other, they have access to money and, res- and funding, uh, they can use that um, to um, expand the resources available to them in the cloud much more easily than they could uh, with an on-premise deployment. You can't expect somebody to deliver you a box and you rack it up uh, for them. So those are the three reasons that we see. Yeah, I think those are great points, KT. And I'm going to recommend that we actually spin up a breakout for on cloud versus prem. This seems like a really great conversation. And I think multiple people could get engaged. And I'm actually going to appoint Hook Hua, one of our SAWG members, to go into that room and make sure that you take notes um, on the fluid conversation, um, because I think this could take another 20 minutes. So um, if we could spin up that breakout room, you'll see a breakout option and people can jump over there. I think the next sort of major conversation we should look at, there's a couple of these comments that people have put up here about really what is an MDPS? You know, I see two different questions about what is an MTB, uh, M- Sorry, MP, MDPS. <laughs> I'm getting all my letters in alphabet soup. Um, so, I, you know, I'm going to focus on this point in particular. I think moving forward, there needs to be a very clear definition of the scope. This will inform separation of concerns between roles of DAC, MDPS, mission algorithm development teams, et cetera. Um, does anybody have any thoughts about this? I think it's one that we've really been struggling with. And I think. The conversation with the the DAC and you know okay that's the job of the analysis platform we don't know where costs go, but if in fact an MDPS were to take community contributions beyond the science team, is that an infringement on the role of the DAC? Um, because the historical view was just put all the data on the DAC, it's open, anybody can use it. But if what we're talking about is this back arrow of contribution back into a data processing system. What is an MDPS? And I welcome anybody to either, um, if you look down in the bottom, you'll see a reactions um, button that you can click on to raise your hand, or you can just simply turn on your camera and you should pop up to the top of this queue and be able to share your thoughts on this. So is it so here's the other one. I'll give it a second. So what is an MDPS? Is it simply a job scheduler like Slurm? Is it like Grid Engine, HT Condor, with the idea being organizations like DPC would plug into an MPBS, MDPS. <laughs> um, say that three times fast. 
So I'll, I'll put out there again, I'll say something inflammatory just to get a reaction out of people. Um, for me, an MDPS is something that does um, data processing on demand or at scale, right? So it's sort of when you, you can run a job in forward processing mode where it's an automated run through as soon as something shows up in the queue, you trigger a whole line of things. It can be done where you do something in batch processing mode um, either reprocessing or just, hey, I've got a lot of data, let's run it through something in batch mode. Um, or it could be something where it's on demand and you've got pre-baked algorithms that you kind of run through. Um, so for me, that's what an MDPS is. And the difference between that and a DAC is that a DAC is simply a place where you house and store all the data and don't necessarily create new products. And we have some, we do have some cases where DACs do um, processing of the data. So there is a, a mix there. So there were some products that um, Sarah mentioned. Um, so, we, and inside of EOS this, we have the DAC and then we also have the SIPs, which are our science investigator led processing, processing centers that actually do processing as well. So I think of an M, the PDS uh, um, taking the SIPs, taking the current SDSs um, and PEATs to a, a new level of opening them up in a open science world um, and bringing in not just the paid and funded uh, NASA investigators, but allowing others to uh, run their algorithms, bring their algorithm to a system that NASA has set up not necessarily saying that those products that are produced will go into a DAC for long-term uh, archive and stewardship, but they are able to see the algorithms that were um, used to create our standard products. And if they wanted to take that algorithm and do something on their own, they can, they now have the opportunities to do that. Um, so I, I think we need to be careful of where that line is of what is the responsibility of, um, the processing system and the data system where we're not directing science. We don't want to be in a place where we are now, um, I think there's a, a line. We want to be able to enable science. We don't want it to do science with some of these systems. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I want to read this, this comment here before I jump over to Jeff and, and maybe also read Jennifer's comment, Jeff, and then I'll get to you in a second. Um, and MDPS is mission focused, DAX span missions focusing on specific science areas. MDPSs serve the mission and their science teams and start to end. DAX live and serve users directly. Um, to this comment, and again, just being inflammatory here, this is the way it has been. And I think part of this architecture study is to, to ask ourselves, you know, do, do outside community, thinking about open science as part of an MDPS objective, play a role beyond the science team? And what does that look like? And how does that delineate from the DAC? And then just to read Jennifer's comment in the chat, if what MDPS is uh, meant to generate some kind of value added products, then currently DACs do have this functionality per se, which I think feeds on Andy's comment that it isn't entirely clear where one starts and the other stops. So with that, while people ruminate on that, Jeff, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah. Um, hi. So I think, um, you know, again, I think the, this question, though, of, of, of scope it, it, it is, um, I think there do need to be sorts of lines. And, and, and I agree. I mean, we all, you know, it's easy to sort of get caught up in what the traditional roles are. But I think even now, uh, there are blurred lines between what a DAC does and what the sort of traditional SIPs do, you know, at NASA, and some of them have sort of take on different, you know, different roles, both in the technical implementations and in, in their roles in serving users, whether it's public users or their science users or, or whatever. And I think what that leads to, though, the problem with that is it leads to two things. One is some sometimes confusion. And the other is inefficiencies, because, you know, you may have redundant functions that occur at different, at different sorts of places. So I think we can. I think we can do both from the open science perspective. I think we can create those brighter lines around what the definition of an MDPS is, but that doesn't preclude 
uh, also supporting you know, the capability, like Andy was saying, for somebody to then take their own version of the system or whatever, and they can bring their own algorithms and products you know, as they wish. But I think if part of the goal here is to create those efficiencies, then I think you need to look for ways to eliminate some of those redundancies, uh, which I think is uh, you know, a lot of it. Yeah, Kurt, do you want to jump in with your comment there? So Kurt in the chat said, in the o OBPG talk, there was definitely a blurring of the lines. They have a great relationship between MVPS, the DAC, and their community. And then uh, Ben in the chat said, as data volumes of the observations significantly increase, do folks foresee that the volume will force the MDP MDPS to be co-located with the data because of the pipeline or latency issues, which I think is a great point. Go ahead and jump in, Jeff. <laughs> so yeah, sorry. Um, so I think uh, that's the, se the second question I think is, is um, might be an implementation detail. I think in, in some cases, certainly that will have to be the case. In others, you know, maybe not. But I don't think uh, from a um, from an architectural kind of conceptual point of view, you know, trying to separate the, the scope and then the architecture from the actual implementation. You know, do these do these two things live in the same place or do they not? Is is something that you can you can decide on a case by case basis. It's, I'm thinking more about kind of roles and. And functions, uh, you know, sort of from that point of view. Um, when I'm thinking about the difference between, a, you know, an MVPS and a DAC, and uh, and and like Kurt was saying, I mean, yes, in some cases, you know, this sort of blurring has worked great for these communities, you know, over uh, over um, you know the last 20 plus years. But if what you're looking for is kind of a uh, a more kind of unified way to do things that you can then scale. I mean, that model may not be the best way to go forward anymore. Like there may be, again, that's, you know, sort of creating those, those sort of brighter lines between who does what and what the roles are. I mean, you can't be overly prescriptive, but I think there's room for improvement there, I guess is what I'm getting at. Yeah, that's a great point. And I do want to just really quick remind any SAWG members I have on this call, please make sure you're in the notes document taking notes. I can't, I can't do it all at the same time. Um, so Jennifer, I think you bring up a point here, um, and I'm kind of in the same boat with you. So I'm going to read it out loud unless you'd like to come off mute. Um, but with, a, can someone move Bob into Hook's breakout room? Uh, with open source science in mind, I think MDPS offers an open platform to enable science for research and user community. Um, Jennifer, do you mind coming off mute and maybe talking about how you resolve this with Andy's previous comment about, um, you know, the MDPS is not to do science, it's to create products? Okay, so uh, thanks. Uh, well, I, I think my a mute button works. Can you hear me correct? Yes. Okay, great. So, so basically, I actually, I learned quite a lot. For, from um, this past couple of days to discuss discussion. So I think what we're discuss about is how can we leverage the current technology to offer even more to advance the NASA science to the researchers and the user community. So I think um, the data is never really the problem that we handle uh, the data very well, I think is I, I, I like to see the flexibility and scalability. And that's what the open platform, I think, um, is uh, sort of planted the seed that, you know, um, allowing user to even explore more. But um, I think the previous uh, speakers sort of talking about in their sort of design and, um, so whatever the approach, it may be, I think we're all on the same boat. Uh, the DAG right now, uh, as Jeannie uh, alluded to, is um, actually we 
have to look at all the aspects. You know, when we provide the services or you know the data the associated with the data, uh, we have to look at uh, uh, all the uh, aspects, especially the security part. Now, I think if we are going towards the open science, right? Um, having this interactive platform and enabling whether the user is from the research community or is from the processing group uh, or a stakeholder, they just want to see how NASA data is, is, is about. I think this having this um, uh, agile and interactive platform, that's the way to go. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one of our SAWG members, can you make sure you're taking notes? Because I think I'm going to try and summarize what I'm hearing people say um, as far as this distinction. So an MDPS is about product generation. A DAC is about data storage of products that need to be stored for long term. Um, up here, you can see someone said 50 years. Um, and DACs provide an opportunity for users to do science. Now, there's still this back arrow where users could be creating products. And that begs the next question for me, which is, at what point do those maybe products that are being created ephemerally become something that is worthy of archive? And I know the DACs have a process for this, but I'm interested to see if others have thoughts about maybe a different way of doing it or um, if, if we even need to revisit it or if just the current system works as is. Jeff, jump in. Yeah, sorry. I'm let me dominate this conversation. Um, I think the question you just asked, Natasha, is part of uh, uh, going to be kind of our, my feedback on the on SPD forty one uh, is you know this idea that uh, yeah, if people are generating these additional products with NASA funding, you know, as part of their research, and then you know what happens to those? I mean, do they do those products go to a DAC? I think it's the same question that you're asking. So I mean. Me does it have to does it have to be from NASA funded research? What if it was from NSF or some other, you know, what if a university did it? What if somebody isn't worthy to make it through the NASA review process for a proposal, but still does valuable science? They just don't do the science that NASA values enough to Right. So they're for. they're sort of there are sort of two categories of this the main categories of what you're talking about. You have somebody that's maybe not funded by NASA, but is using NASA data and generates a derived product with NASA data. That's one thing. Or, you know, you have a NASA funded person that maybe is doing NASA funded research, but not using, not necessarily using NASA data or using other data like GOES or something like that. Where, and they've generated a large data set. In fact, I have, a, I know a guy at our center who, who has that very use case. Like, where does that data go and who pays for it and how is it managed? You know, it's, I think it's those kinds of questions. So, and I don't have the answer, but I think what might happen is the role, however NASA wants to do this, it might mean that then the role of the DAX may have to expand a little bit to, to, to get our arms around that data, which like Andy said, is currently kind of out of scope uh, for us, you know, but uh, that may not, maybe that's not what we want to do going forward. Yeah, I want to do a quick time check. Um, you all have done such a tremendous job hanging in there for the last three days, and we have two minutes to go. So um, please, if you feel like you didn't get to say what you wanted to say, you're free to um, drop it in the Mentimeter. We will be able to see these results going forward. I will not close it. Andy, um, do we want to close the other breakout and make sure they come back to the room for closeout for the day? So the other Andy just said there's a good discussion going on and he thinks it's going to go beyond two. So I'm asking him how much further beyond two. <laughs> um. Okay. I'm, I didn't mean to shut this conversation down. If somebody else wants to jump in and say something, I think Jeannie has, uh, Bink, uh, Binky is in the chat, has had quite a few things to say. If you want to come off mute and maybe share some of your ideas and thoughts. Hi, Natasha. Thank you. 
<laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, going back to Sarah's presentation, DACs have been in place for almost 30 years now. And they didn't just spring up, you know, you know, automatically. They were a process that was in place from 1958 when NASA was first created. And they've, what's been really excellent about DACs is that they've been able to evolve with the technology and with new processes. So we do have a process in place, you know, for anyone who wants to add data to the collection, they go to the DAC and they talk to the DAC and the DAC, you know, does a whole inventory on that collection, then submits it to NASA and then NASA takes a look at it and runs it by senior scientists to see whether this is a data set that should be added to the collection. Because no matter what, everything comes down to money. So there is a process in place for that. And I'm pretty sure that process will evolve as we move into open science. And like uh, Shell was saying, we don't exactly know all the features of open science yet, but we will you know, in the next uh, few years. And uh, at that time, uh, the DACs and the MDPS component people who are running MDPS, whether it's several MDPSs or one, they'll all understand the process too. But it is uh, going to be, uh, you know, through meetings like this where we're getting all these ideas, uh, we'll be able to evolve to meet the needs of the future. But we'll, at the same time, we still have to meet all the requirements that NASA has imposed on itself as an agency. So both of them go hand in hand. And that's just like that IT security question that keeps popping up. You know, how are we going to do this with all these IT security problems? Well, we'll have to figure it out. Yeah. And I think that's that's what this workshop is about, right? We are being asked what an architecture would look like for an MDPS to support open science, right? And so that is it's it's not coming directly as a level one requirement from the missions. It's coming from a requirement from Kevin Murphy, right? Like, what would this look like, right? He's not enforcing it as a requirement yet, but he's saying, if it were, what would it look like? What would that architecture look like? Um, so, and Mike, that's exactly true. And Kevin Murphy can also be trumped by the CIO at NASA or by the export control authorities or any number of other uh, bureaucrats within the agency. So we just all have to work on it and try and get there. Yeah, and that's what this study is about, is is it worth it, right? Throwing this extra thing in there, um, what would that look like? So I do, um, I believe this is Mike Gangle here in the chat said something about like, couldn't anybody just um, create and reprocess products on demand and I, want to call out that that's a very non-trivial effort and that's why MDPSs exist. Um, there, you know, we know that the MDPSs are extremely expensive part of a mission, um, especially like with missions like NISAR. And so, no, not just anybody can do that because not just anybody has the skills, right? Often we require skills from many different people and they don't always have the facilities and resources to be able to do it as well. So, so I, I agree with you. I was, I was being somewhat facetious with how easy it could be. <laughs> but the goal of this open science isn't just to, you know, document how we built a product and now that product's out there forever. It, it should be to share and leverage all these uh, platforms. And if there's value in the product existing, then there should be value in keeping the um, MDPS up and running to be able to do that. And if if at some point we have to do that cost benefits to say we're spending too much money regenerating this product let's store it who stores it that that's certainly a conversation to happen um yeah 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 and i appreciate it i've been trying to poke um poke the hornet's nest as well so um somebody said that there's some concerns about turning a science data system into help desks for users rather than focusing on generating world class science data products um, do you want to unpack that a little bit? Whoever that was. This hey, is this fair. Is, yeah, this is yeah. David Weiss. Uh, um, yeah, I, I just come out of perspective from being on an SDS uh, for Grace Follow-On and, and, and being an MC. And 
you know, our, our algorithms are quite complex and, and the code is quite complex and there's a very limited handful of users that can, uh, can run them similar to what you were saying with NICER. So um, I, I think in theory, it, it does sound really good. The open science, the MDPS, uh, M, yeah, I said that right, MDPS. <laughs> it's alphabet um, soup, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, I think that, that there are, there are some, some concerns uh, uh, there with limited resources and where, where does that uh, uh, help come from um, and, and what's the value? I think those are hard questions. Yeah, and just like I was saying, it's non-trivial to run an MDPS. It's a non-trivial cost value for DAX to provide user services. Um, so, and I'm seeing some comments in the chat of sort of just general approval of this comment and plus ones um, happening. So just quick check, Andy, did you get a check back from Andy Bingham on how much longer he was gonna be? I just got one back and I, he's saying 15 minutes. Um, okay. Well, 12 minutes an ounce, I think, uh, 15 after the hour, maybe. Okay. Well, so we have a couple options here. If people feel that this is um, everything, if you want to hit another topic, go ahead and stick it up here in the Mentimeter. Um, I will, or, you know, there is the chat. Um, the Mentimeter is great too, because uh, then everyone can kind of see it in real time and it doesn't get lost in a stream. Um, Otherwise, we could take a 10 minute break and come back when they're ready. So I don't wanna close the conversation though, if um, so I'll stay here, um, if new topics come up and others wanna bring up some, some other things that you don't think have been covered or talked about um, when we're considering a data system architecture to support the next generation of missions, what data system efficiencies look like, um, and how do we support earth science applications and open science all at the same time? Yeah, Kurt, um, you didn't come off mute last time, so I'll read your comment from the chat. This came up with AOS when explaining open science to the science team. If we make their software fully readable, even during development, what is their obligation, if any, to respond to user questions? And I think that brings up an interesting topic that we've kind of taught, and I, it definitely came up in the open science breakout of you know, open science is a community and there has to be a peer review process and quality control and that there's even in, in GitHub or GitLab where it's um, open, you know, an open repo, there's still a moderator um, screening pull requests, uh, sorry, pull requests to say, okay, this is an acceptable pull, I'm gonna ingest it. Um, And Ka uh, Kathleen seems to agree. So any thoughts on that? You know, it, and I think this feeds on expanding the scope of an MDPS and providing user services. If you have a moderator, um, somebody decides who that moderator is and maybe then it's no longer open because that moderator is gonna intrinsically have bias um, about what's there. Does somebody who's participated in the open source software community have any thoughts about how this is handled in general? All right, I'm going to take a read on the silence to say that uh, Andy M, should we just take a seven minute break? Um, so actually, Andy is saying, uh, Andy B is saying um, he doesn't know how long the next one is going, and he's fine with us wrapping up this session for the day and having Hook give a, uh, a debrief in the morning um, so we don't have to wait for that one. Um, so, Susan, I'm assuming if we close this out, it will 
mess up the breakout room. So I don't want to yep, do that. It, it will just, <laughs> correct. Yeah, I can leave the, I, I'll just leave the meeting open. Um, it will be okay. a rather unceremonious exit for all, for anyone else. Um, but yeah, if people want to just leave the meeting, I will keep it running. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for hanging in there and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Sebastian.